What this is basically all about is a trip that Paul is going to be taking here starting uh, Monday the 6th of March yeah. here. And uh, his plan, I don't know, we talked, but he still is going to go anyway, <laughs> is to go from here on a snowmobile with two other individuals. And they plan on going from here to Fairbanks, Alaska by snowmobile through the middle of Canada into the Yukon Territory, take a look at the Arctic Ocean, and then go over to Fairbanks. And uh, I don't think that's ever been done before. There, are, I guess there are sleds that have gone there, but they've taken the roads. This is going through wild country. Welcome to Snowmobile Sessions Live on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. It's the number one destination to learn about snowmobiling, network with other sledders, and have an awesome time doing it. We'll meet other snowmobilers that share your passion and show your fan photos along the way. Snowmobile Sessions Live. Enjoy the ride. This episode of Snowmobile Sessions Live is brought to you by Energy Power Sports. They're Oakville's full-line BRP dealer with sales and service to all BRP models and so much more. Energy Power Sports always has the fun in store with a wide selection of clothing, parts, and accessories for all your power sports passions. Make Energy Power Sports your source for Can-Am off-road ATV and side-by-sides. Can-Am on-road Riker and Spider, including the sporty F3S, Sea-Doo watercraft and switch pontoon boats and Alumacraft fishing boats powered by Mercury Marine. Put yourself on a Manitou pontoon or a widescape stand-up snowmobile. Energy Power Sports is the home for Lynx and Ski-Doo snowmobiles for the entire family. Do you feel the energy? Energy Power Sports, 879 Cranberry Court, Oakville, Ontario, or online, energypowersports.ca. All right. Thanks, Just Fly Low. He said in the chat, Gary's got the technical stuff on his side today. And he says, right on time. Nice job, Gary. <laughs> so anyway, we got the three old guys. We got all three of them here. Just to my uh, my right is Rob Hallstrom. We have below me uh, Rex Hibbert. And beside him is Paul Dick. And they are the three old guys that took a trip to Alaska. How are you folks doing tonight? Great. Yeah, excellent. Let's say so. Here. What do you go ahead? I say we're doing good here. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. So it's been a few months since you did the ride. How you guys been feeling? Are you planning anything else? Uh, we don't really have anything on the books, but I think we're all feeling pretty good. Yeah. How did it come to be? How did the idea of, uh, of riding to Alaska come to be? Uh, we we kind of eat, we all kind of point at each other there. I don't know who had the idea actually, but in 2019, we took a ride up to Churchill, Manitoba on Hudson Bay. And that was about a 3,000 mile ride. And we just, we just had a great time and everything went just perfect on that trip. And we just started thinking about what else we could do, and Alaska kind of came up, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> and and then as far as planning something like that goes, how how did you go about doing that? That's a pretty big undertaking, right? That we we spent uh, many many hours doing that. Uh, I think most people don't realize the time we put into it. Uh, you know, you just kind of spread out a map and and get an idea where you wanted to go. And then I would, I just made a lot of phone calls. I'd call little tiny towns, maybe call a snowmobile repair shop and explain to a guy what you wanted to do and ask how local people rode in that area, how they would do it if they were going to take a ride like that. 
And usually you'd call one guy and he'd connect you with his buddy and his buddy would know a trapper and you just keep finding out more and more information. So I did that, you know, I, I'm retired. So I'd putz around doing that with the computer for a long time. And, you know, we just sat there on, uh, with base camp, a Garmin mapping deal, laying out a, a route on the computer and over, you know, over quite a few hours, it just kept getting to be a better and better route. So that's how we got started. Cool. Nice. Was it easy to get information? Everybody was seemed very helpful or did you have to really turn over a lot of rocks to get some solid answers? Well, you know, some people that weren't real excited to talk to you, but for the most part, people were real helpful. And uh, I've done a lot of, uh, since I was a kid, I've been fascinated by Northern <laughs> Canada and Alaska, reading stories about explorers and trappers and stuff. So, you know, a lot of the route that we went on were historic trails for one reason or another from the gold rush or different things like that. So that kind of helped us get the general idea on, yeah, when we talked to people, people were, were pretty helpful. I think a lot of them didn't think we'd actually do it, but, uh, you know, you just kept getting more information and it worked out. That's awesome. Was there any time in the, in, in pre, before the ride that you guys just were thinking about throwing in the towel? Well, not before the ride, I don't think. <laughs> no, we, we talked, <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it for quite a while. Uh, I mean, just kind of kicking the idea, maybe, and you know, I, I started kind of looking at a possible route, and we weren't really too committed. <laughs> and then after about a year, we got together and had dinner one night, and then when we were on the way home, we started calling each other on the phone and said, you know, this is, are we going to do this or not? And by the time we got home, everybody was all in. So, right on. And how many miles did it end up? Uh the pre-plan look like and then what did it end up being when you finally finished oh i think we took some bets anybody remember what they bet for mileage before we left you guys i think was over was over all the bets i think i think mine was 43 and and i won if i remember right because it ended up being about 48 right Hey, are you trying to see we got to pay you for that now? <laughs> well, it seems like it. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, we thought it was going to, we thought it'd be 4,000 or a little bit over. So we were kind of guessing in that area. And well, it ended up being 4,800? Pretty close, yeah. What were you going to say, Paul? I just said the speedometers were off because we changed the gearing and the track drives on them. Um, so I don't know if there was more or less, but it was right around 5,000 miles, I believe. Yeah, right on. So what did you, what did you ride? I mean, we're going to see the sleds, but tell people about the, uh, the snowmobiles that, uh, that you ended up riding on this adventure. Well, you want me to talk, Rob? Go ahead, Paul. Actually, yeah. We, we rode uh, Articat Norsemans, they're called. They're kind of a cross between a regular machine and a utility machine. And um, they seem to work pretty well because we run so much different terrain. We're on some trails, some rivers, and so on and so forth. And um, when you get up in the real deep snow, it'd be nice to have a super wide or something like that. But then when you're on the trails, then you're going to sacrifice on the other end. So um, it's just a 153 track with a 15 wide, I believe they are, and um, 800 motor in them, which uh, they work real well. They had a lot more grunt. When we went to Churchill, we had um, 600s, and um, when you're pulling that heavy load, uh, you'd be a little shy on power with a 6. So yeah. that's, that's what we um, and Yeah, now you lead, built... Go ahead. I said the mileage wise, a lot of people ask, why don't you run four strokes? Well, they don't make a particular, uh, Arctic Cat doesn't make a, a four stroke motor in that chassis. So that's why we chose to go with the way we did. Yeah. You're packing oil then as well as gas. Is That's correct? 
Yep. I think we took off with like 15 or 20, maybe 20 some gallons of oil. And we put it in gas cans because the first part of the deal, we didn't need the um, to use all the gas that we needed to haul until we got up farther. And then well, the oil we used up and then we had an empty can, an empty can. And then when we got up there farther, we needed all that capacity. And then we had extra oil on board or extra gas. That's right, what some right. people don't realize. They see our sleighs and all those gas cans. And we had the capability to haul a lot of gas, but we didn't normally do that. I mean, each each day or each leg of the trip, we would kind of determine how far it was to the next town and, and make a judgment on how many cans to fill. We didn't pull any, we didn't want to pull any more weight than we had to. Uh, but there was some that stretches. I think the longest one was from Old Crow to Fort Yukon, where it was, I mean, we were breaking trail the whole way in deep snow and it was 330 miles. So, you know, by that point, we'd used up most of our oil and we had. We filled all the cans in there. I think we even filled our bunny boots up with a little extra gas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, now, um, you had mentioned about your previous sleds in another ride, and I know that you have some experience with Kane's Quest. I want each of you to go through and let us know what your experience is. I, I know we're dealing with some racers and some riders here. Um, so just, you know, let's start with uh, let's start with Rex, and then we'll go to Paul, and then we'll let Rob uh, finish us off. Well, I've been I've been uh, racing snowmobiles ever since I was oh, about well about twelve I guess my dad had a bought a sixty five Evinrude or six sixty six I can't remember but uh, we went to a couple local uh, winter carnivals and and uh, it kind of escalated from there uh, <clears throat> but I. I live out in Idaho, so it was it was uh, mountain riding and uh, oh, I I'd done almost every every kind of race there was ovals, cross country, snow cross, hill climbs, run the hill climb circuit with my boys for a couple of years. We'd go around every weekend and do the hill climb circuit, and then then I <clears throat> got together with Paul and. Uh, run the well we'd run the the 500 race in minnesota the winnipeg st paul when it first started and then thunder bay down uh racing against each other that was an individual thing we done that that's where we kind of got to know each other and then uh and then we uh we uh he talked it, this is his fault. He talked me in going up to Alaska and running the Iron Dog, and that was that was uh, quite an eye opener. But it was uh, boy, it was a good experience. Then you're uh, probably glad you had that experience going into something like this Alaska run, right? Oh yeah, all 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 that helped. And then then he talked me into going doing the Kane's Quest race three three years. So. <laughs> Uh, that's how you know my friend Kirk, right? Kirk Hastings. Yeah, that, that's where we met Kirk Hastings. Oh, we met, I mean, we have met so many neat people on, uh, you know, on snowmobile racing, and and this ride was unbelievable. All the cool people we met, you know, and just, you know, people on snowmobiles are pretty cool bunch of guys, <laughs> and and yeah, gals, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, that's the thing. I started following you guys when you started the ride, and it was it just kept, pardon the pun, snowballing, and uh, and the the fan base started growing and growing. And when Rob and I were talking last night, he says he finds it odd that someone comes up to him in the grocery store to get a selfie with him. <laughs> yeah. I, so even out here, I uh, oh, I walked in a parts store. Uh, a guy sticks out his hand and says, "I got to shake your hand." That was an amazing trip, you know. And and you run into that kind of where you don't really expect it. So, yeah, between you know, between 
it was it was quite an adventure and and then uh rob's daughter done a fantastic job of putting uh putting some history with it you know and and uh, a daily a daily report you know and uh and it really drew in a crowd i uh, it's unbelievable how many people were was interested that's great yeah it was, it's such a such an accomplishment and and to think of your your ages and how old are you rex i turned 70 on the trip i i'm i'm 70 now nice nice and paul what about you how how old am i i, I yeah, turned old are, uh, i turned 73 in september that's so, awesome good I'm nice the, work man you? Yeah, and and, uh, and Rob, <laughs> old enough to know better. Rob's a baby. Yeah. So how about your how about your experience and 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 uh, your passions here on this one, Paul? Well, it, well, we've been on different runs, you know, but most of them were competitive runs, and this one here was just a a fun run, so to speak. Um, there was a lot of times it wasn't fun, believe me. And um, there's more times than once these guys would be laughing at something and we'd be in the middle of nowhere. And I'd say, this is no laughing matter, you know, it, uh, <laughs> but that's, but it's, we just keep on chucking away, you know, and um, it was, uh, it was, it was an experience, you know, uh, when we first got out of Flin Flon, you know, they, they told me to bring a chainsaw along. So I packed one of them up and I thought we were on a logging job, you know, the, cutting through the brush it took us about it must have been up there for two days i believe wasn't it rob to get through all that wooded area and uh yeah, more than that actually we've sure got some about. photos of that it's yeah are you do, you do you ever think that they maybe sent you that way just because they needed some wood cut up it's like yeah guys <laughs> go this way take a chainsaw <laughs> yeah and a splitter and i want them about this long <laughs> yeah I don't think that anybody would be would go up there and get that wood anyhow where we were at. <laughs> there wasn't the no no snowmobile tracks, nothing for I don't know how many decades up through that one area there. Yeah, it was that was yeah. quite a deal there. Yeah, pretty crazy. And then how about how about you, Rob? How old are you, and what's your experience? Well, I'm I'm sixty six, and I've been snowmobiling my whole life, but for me, snowmobiling was always just kind of an adventure, a way to get to, to out of the way places. I was never really into racing so much. Uh, I, I rode with a lot of racers. I just did a lot of riding, but I really didn't do much racing. And then I went out on an uh, overnight trip. My cousin, Joey Hallstrom, organized an overnight ride uh, from his cabin to Paul's house in Grand Rapids. And that's the first time I met Paul and Paul had a Kane's Quest sled that he rode. And uh, we started talking about Kane's Quest and I'd never heard of the race. So I, I was checking it out, asking Paul about it. And then I watched Paul and Rex race it that year. And I just had to go give it a try. I mean, that, that race is something else as far as adventure. So that, that got me into that race. You know, it would, but Paul and Rex aren't telling you. They've been to the Iron Dog. They've been to Kane's Quest, all these big races. Uh, they haven't just been to them. They've done pretty good. I mean, for for rookie teams, they come in and people are always shocked at how well they do. So, Are they still fast today? Like, are they, they still kicking butt on sleds? Can you keep up? Is what I'm asking, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, they make me they make me feel like I'm okay, but <laughs> I don't know. Nice. Nice. You got any fond memories of the of the ride? Like what was your most memorable uh mem most memorable thing about the the ride to Alaska? Well, you know, my my what I really enjoyed seeing was when we crossed the um the boundary line or whatever it is, the going into Alaska and we stopped on that porky Ryan, porcupine river, I believe it was. And you could see the, or they had cut the survey line or whatever it was through there. 
to me, that was kind of a highlight because we finally made it to Alaska. You know, and plus there was all kinds of other things, but to me, that was the main, the main deal in my th in my thoughts, anyhow. Cool, cool. And what about you, Rex? Yeah, that was that that was a highlight there. It, you know, it was uh, we was all grins about right then, and uh, <laughs> it was only a few miles down the down the river though, and we was all stuck in the slush. <laughs> it wasn't so <laughs> funny then, or fun then. <laughs> How many days did it take you to do the whole thing, and what day would that have been that you hit that border? Oh my uh, boy, I I, I think we're. Was, I think we were on the trail 39 days. And Holy. I don't know. When we hit the border, we were, I don't know, probably still five, six days out or something. Uh, where, where we crossed the border, that, that was one of the most remote legs we were on. We were we were a long ways from anything. But, but yeah, we were all pretty pumped up there. It was, it was fun to know we'd actually made it. Very cool. Very cool. And then what was so, some of the, 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 the bad things that you had happen along the way or, or the things you'd rather not talk about? <laughs> there was lots of them. <laughs> yeah. Probably the bad were being stuck in, on the ice jams and stuff. I mean, it was so much work lifting those buggers out and, tipping them over back and forth you know it was um it was a uh, a lot of work yeah. our, our, our first thousand miles was on groom trails and you know all the equipment's brand new and you're on nice smooth groom trails so the first thousand miles went by in a flash no problems at all but then we left the groom trails and tried to follow these old cat trails which uh you know these are old trails where they used to drive through there with a caterpillar pulling sleighs to bring supplies to these remote villages and we were trying to follow these trails and that's where we were doing all this cutting all these trees and having so much trouble and when we got in we got into that i mean everything started to kind of go out of snail space and you, we were all getting tired out and i I mean, we didn't really talk about it, but I mean, you could just tell the wheels were coming off the expedition there. We, we were going to be in trouble if it stayed like this. Uh, but fortunately, we got through that leg and things started getting a lot easier. That's that's where my sled started on fire there. That was that was probably a low point for me. I would, you see smoke coming out of your snowmobile, you're thinking, this is it, you know. But luckily, we were able to get it out and recover yeah, I don't think Paul was going to double ride you all the way to Alaska. <laughs> I don't uh, think we, so. <laughs> you know, we, we certainly do that when we're in a pinch, but it's no fun. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Very cool. What kind of uh, gear or equipment do you have to, do you have to uh, think of in advance for doing a big uh, excursion like this? Well, we carried a lot of a lot of equipment we had an arctic oven tent with a wood stove and some real warm sleeping bags you know it's i thought we were going to have to stay in that tent maybe three four nights we were hoping to never stay in it but there's just a few sections where we didn't know where we'd be able to stay and you know you bring a lot of parts you bring you know a lot of gas and oil you have to make sleds to sleighs to haul all this stuff so there was a lot of prep time and we had the snowmobiles over at Paul's place. Paul did a lot of that. And we, you know, did some modification to the snowmobiles to make sure they were up to the task and kind of got everything. What, what kind of, what kind of mods would you have been doing? Would you have been beefing up the suspension or you, you know, I guess in your racing, you're trying to make everything as light as possible while being strong. That probably doesn't factor in on something like this. No, that, that doesn't matter for something like this, but um, you know, we we put DuPont high facts on because it lasts so much longer. We added uh, fiberglass overload springs and some heavy duty rear Fox shocks to the rear suspension, uh, geared the machines down quite a bit. 
They come with, I think it's a two and a half inch lug track. We changed that to a 1.6. Uh, put a few studs in the tracks. Uh, you know, hardwired uh, GPS units and in them with bigger windshields on, things like that. Mirrors, all that. Nice. We got. To see, I see Rex is uh, is coming in on a second time. <laughs> Very yeah, cool. I, Let's say hi to some people in the chat here and then we'll get we'll keep talking here. But we have uh just fly low in the house, Renegade X come in. Uh Jacob Masser says, What's up, fellas? Glad to see the three old guys at Hades this year. We had a picture uh, he sent in right uh right off the bat from that. Uh who else we got in here? Dominator says, Hey guys, uh Rob Overholt says good evening. We have Uncle Buck, he's in the house, DP Rocks is there. Uh Everyone's talking about the snow they've had. Adam Skinner, how you doing? Uh, Sault Ste. Marie got good snow, he says. Uh, Wisco Sledheads is in the house. And um, who else? Mike Galitz. Congrats on the 1,000 subs there, Mike, as well. And he sent in some pictures tonight. Uh, what else? Jeff Dancer, good evening, everyone. Denon Oosterman's in the house. Uh, William McClearly, he's another old guy that likes to ride. Um, Brian Lynn from Slush Lake and Ron Castellute. The list goes Perfect. on and on. Whitetail Stables, he's a weekly stable here. Uh, you know, it keeps going. I'm just trying to think if I missed anybody here, but and they'll be coming on as we get going here. But yeah, it's uh, it's pretty awesome to see everybody tonight. And if you have any questions, just post them up there. So, um, in there, but yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. You were gonna say something there, Paul, when I rudely interrupted you. I can't remember here. What was it about? What were we talking about? Oh, we we're talking about the sled modifications and things like that that you do. Yeah. Well, that's that's a big part of it, you know. And we've over the years, we've, you know, all three of us have, um, you know, doing competitive stuff and riding. We kind of learned a lot about different things, you know. On them. Uh, all in all, they're they're pretty good this stock, but we. We made them halt for stout, extra rivets, and so on and so forth. And all that. Then they're just going to say, when we got up on that, making the run, you know, the, the people were great, you know, that we met along the way. They Because the, they just kind of mushroomed the following that we had, and they, were, they knew when we were coming into a town, they'd come meet us, and then when we got to town, they'd feed us, and so on and so forth. Actually, I think they kind of felt sorry for us, you know. They really, he said, these guys are a bubble off, you know. So they they wanted to help us out the best they could. But they, that was great, you know. A good, good bunch of people. Very cool. And and I take it you sound Paul like the mechanic, and Rob did the planning. And was Rex just the good looks for the for the gang to get your warm accommodations at night, or did you guys each have a role in uh, in this whole thing? Yeah, I would say Rex probably the he's probably the movie star of the bunch. I mean, I'm certainly not. No, we all we all did. You know, um, Rob did the, most of the planning, and I had the we did most of the sled building at my garage right here, and then. Um, and Rex did a lot of the uh, the route planning and mechanical stuff with this. And his his brother Kirk um, Hibbert, which I'm sure you know, you've heard of him. He uh, he came down here and actually helped us for a couple of days and did some shock work on us on the machines and helped us gear him down. And um, so that that helped a bunch. You know. Otherwise, we'd have been in tough shape i think with that stock suspension in there or the shocks on them yeah right what did you did you have any problems with blowing shocks or do you beef it up enough that that was never going to be an issue boy you know we we put those fiberglass overloads on there and then kirk um we got good shocks from fox um and they were set up pretty well but then crook took them down and gave them a little bit of a fine tune so to speak um if we wanted to have them on there we'd been um in pretty tough shape hitting a lot of stuff it's not just the machine but then you're pulling that bargain behind and when you give her the onion you know it pulls down on the back uh, you know quite a bit of weight on, on the back shock on it 
but no, they, they right. worked well. So. That that's terrific. Yeah, we, you know, you talked about what role we play. We, I did a lot of the route stuff, and we worked out of Paul's shop, and, but all of us, all of us, worked on it together. Rex kind of does a little of everything. I, I bounce ideas off Rex, so both of us did a lot of route stuff on our computers and talked on the phone about what we ought to do. And we all kind of seemed like we all just kind of worked together really well. Rex is definitely our strongest rider. I I typically led when it was a when it was a nice groomed trail. Then when it gets really rough, we send Rex out there. <laughs> Me and Paul just sit back <laughs> and watch him break trail. <laughs> Nice. How much how much trail busting did you actually do? Would you percentage wise, if you're to say was it was it twenty percent of the ride or was it thirty percent or higher? Or what do you think? We were on groomed trails for the first thousand miles in I bet that's all the groomed trails we were on. Wow. And I bet we were breaking trail. 90% of the time, other than that, I mean, we were really surprised. We thought, like we went down the Mackenzie River, which is almost a thousand miles of river travel, and there's towns every 100, 200 miles, and we just assumed somebody would ride back and forth between the towns. We didn't expect a groomed trail, but we thought somebody would do that, and that's, we just didn't find that. I mean, once you were about 10, 20 miles out of a town, there would be no more tracks. So. Wow. So did, were you running GPSs? Like, or what, what type of GPS were you running? How were you mapping this? Yeah, we had, both me and Rex had uh, 276 CX Garmin GPSs. And we had laid out the whole route at home uh, and programmed into that, into our GPS. So... In theory, we're just following a line on our GPS. Well, of course, it's a little different on the computer when you actually get there. So that, you know, that would just keep us kind of going the right direction, and then we just have to make uh, decisions constantly as to the fine details about where you're going to go. Yeah, and, and someone had asked if you had heated seats and on the sled as well. What other electronics were you? like that were you relying on or you didn't bother touching? Well, we just had the, we just had the Garmin GPS running. That's what we used to navigate with. And uh, Rex carried a spot locator and I had an in-reach locator. So in case of an emergency, we could send out a message to home. And uh, you know, my daughter was mentioned Casey. Had, I think that was a real critical aspect to our trip and it's probably something that we learned in Kane's quest is having a support team at home is a huge thing and uh, just to keep our families in the loop we decided early on to create a facebook page and we didn't want to have you know 10 kids calling us every night because so often it was so hard to communicate so at the end of each day or sometimes in the morning I'd just send a quick text text message to my daughter that, you know, we're we're in at Port Good Hope at a cabin or something, something about where we were, what was going on. And then she would post it up on the Facebook page. And the idea was that the family then would know what was going on. And I I had plans to write quite a bit of history and stuff about the trip, because I because I knew, you know, that's why we were going to some of these places. And before the trip, I, you know, we get together at Christmas and I told my daughter, I said, you know, there's going to be a couple of nights where we don't have internet. Maybe you could post up some history. And I told her about a few different things. And uh, once we started going, she kind of took over with it. And I quit even trying to put anything on there. I would, I would just send her a, a very short message about what was going on and she was turning it into really good, uh, interesting stories, and that got a lot of people following us, and it it helped us out a lot. I mean, we got on those first cat trails. We really struggled through there. I mean, we we were we were really having a hard time finding our way through there, and we thought that as we were getting close to South End, 
Saskatchewan. I thought, I had heard that the locals rode out to a certain lake and fished there. So we thought we were going to pick up a snowmobile trail there. When we got there, we couldn't find any sign of a trail on that lake. And it's not a big lake. So when we're driving around and around this lake and I mean, we were, we had camped out the night before we were, we were pretty beat down, pretty tired. It just was not going well. And I sent Casey a note, just said, uh, you know, we know we're close to the trail, but we can't find it. And, you know, no idea what she's going to do with that information. But uh, pretty soon a text came back from her with a, some GPS coordinates, which we put in, and that was like 30 miles away. That didn't seem to make any sense to us. But then with some verbiage, it said the trail leaves right on the south side of this creek. Watch out. The ice is bad by that creek. And that was that was enough of a hint for us to to drive around over by that creek and actually got off the snowmobile and just started walking through the snow and all of a sudden you could feel the hard pack of a trail underneath the fresh snow and that that got us going off that lake and that 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 brought the trail into some trees where you could see the trail easy enough brought us out to a pretty big lake so now we know we're really close to this town but it's a big lake and it's snowing. So it's just like whiteout conditions, which is really hard to figure out where to go. But here comes a, here comes a snowmobiler. So we stop him right away, flag him down. So did you come from town? I mean, I'm, we're thinking we could follow his track back to town. And he said, Oh, I'm coming for you guys. And we're like, all right. And so he turns around and starts leading us to town. And as we approach town, more and more riders are coming out and uh, they're all coming just for us. I mean, so we stop and talk to them all. One of them was uh, Tommy Bird and he said, follow me, you're coming over to my place and you're going to stay at a, I got a little cabin in my backyard. So we nice. went over there and I mean, there's no hotel in that town. So, I mean, we were pretty cranked up. It's like, it was just a, we turned the corner, got off these cat trails and got a nice place to stay and, that community, I mean, the guy brought us over a wonderful supper of fish and everybody stopped by and was visiting with us. And it was just a great experience. And that kind of seemed to start the start the ball rolling. And it seemed like after that, every time we'd roll into these small towns, they knew who we were and that we were coming and they'd help us out as much as they could. So it was a great experience. Yeah. That is unbelievable and did they find that out from the facebook posts or just the buzz around town well I, you know my daughter had put something on facebook and somebody in town there picked it up and you know, one of the guys that came over is a trapper that trapped in that area and he had sent that information to my daughter that that kind of got us out of there and uh, then he actually brought us a supper over that night and then you know then it was just kind of the buzz around town and we were actually supposed to leave there and go to Wollaston Lake, which was going to involve about uh, 60, 70 mile run up uh, Reindeer Lake and then another 40 miles of these cat trails to Wollaston Lake. And it was snowing like crazy outside. I mean, they had a lot of fresh snow and it was snowing hard. And the Lord, I mean, one, one local guy came in and he had just come off the lake and had to leave his sleigh out in the slush because he was all stuck out there. And they were telling us we were going to have to stay there five or six days and let that snow take a set before we'd be able to, to ride through it. So we were sitting there. I mean, we're already so dang tired. We're behind and it's so early in our trip. And the only way, the only other way around it that I knew of was that there was a highway that, you know, went for about 150 miles that we could take but before the trip i'd asked people about riding along that highway and they had explained that the ditches were all rocky and it's a lot of canadian shield there so you know it's just it's a tar road there's just no way you can ride on the road so as we're sitting there that night talking to tommy bird and the locals about it we said how about running down that highway you know we got a you know we got all this fresh snow and they kind of looked at each other and said well maybe and Somebody made a phone call and found out that the snowplows weren't going to go out until sometime during the day, the next day. So 
next morning we were up early and headed off right down the highway, which which looked like a groomed snowmobile trail. I mean, it was nothing but snow. So that kind of got us back on schedule and brought us kind of into the next phase of our journey where we were going across lakes and rivers. So we were kind of happy to be away from the cat trails. Yeah. Here's a good question from Whitetail Stables. He, he said, did you guys wear floater suits? We did not. Uh, I wear a text vest and that would help, but they weren't, they weren't floater suits. No. No. And what about your boots, your footwear? What do you find is the warmest on your feet? We all, we all uh, wore the army surplus. Uh, they're called bunny boots. They're, uh, and <clears throat> they're not real tall, but even, even though they can get full of water, you can, uh, the insulation in the boot is uh, is sealed off, so <clears throat> when it's wet, it don't lose its insulation. So you can just dump dump the water out, and wring your socks out, or or put on a dry pair, and uh, and you still got warm feet. That's a little trick from uh, Kane's Quest. Uh, I think Kirk uh, showed us those boots when he was on the show. Yeah. Uh, when we run the iron dog back in 95 that was mandatory you you they didn't let you they didn't let you leave without uh without the big white bunny boots you know so um yeah they we, we learned how important they was back then they actually work pretty good you know right because they aren't real thick up when it comes up around your ankle and if you want you can put um um, duct tape around there, kind of seal it off, so you can go in the, actually in the water over your boots, and um, it'll not a lot of it will leak in there unless you're in there too long, which we were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks for my bunny boots, Rex. Kirk says, <laughs> Yeah, and what about your hands? How do you keep your hands from getting cold? Well, we all wore those gauntlets. They make different ones, um, different shapes and so on and so forth. But um, the handlebar heaters on these machines are pretty good. Um, there's, a, I think, like a three settings on them, low, medium, and higher, or whatever. And um, and with the wind gauntlets on there, when you uh, a lot of times your hands get wet when you're digging out <laughs> so on and so forth, you can actually... Um, when you put them on there and you turn them on high, they heat pretty good and actually dries your gloves. A bit. <coughs> if you can keep your hands, you know, out of the elements, they you can stay pretty warm. Yeah, it's true. As soon as they get wet, though, that's that when they get wet, that can be the, the the tough thing. Did you? How many pairs of extra items like that did you carry? Oh, I, no, think I think, we I, I, think I had pairs. four pair of gloves with. And Climb was a sponsor. They helped us out with a, a lot of gear. And I, I was so impressed with that stuff. <laughs> One of the things they gave us was a pair of guide gloves. And I had all these extra gloves. And I, I think I wore those. I'm, I know I wore those glide gloves every day of the trip. And a couple of days I got them wet and had to change to another pair. But they were just a medium weight glove that worked really well for us. You know, we like those soft handlebar muffs so we on a real warm day we roll them up on the handlebars and don't use them and if it's a little colder we put those over our hands and like paul was saying even if your gloves get wet you can you can turn up your hand warmers and they pretty much cook the the gloves dry again so it worked out real good for us yeah that's so you care you just wore as thin a gloves as you can under the muffs, and that probably helps from, you know. Oh, I wear the, those guide gloves. They're not super thin. They're just kind of a medium weight glove, and I, I just found them to be perfect for me. I, everybody's different, but well, I think well, me and Rex must, me and Rex must have both liked them because we were constantly uh, picking up the other guy's gloves. It seems like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think I wore mine. Uh... I think I wore them uh, flying gloves just about every day. I, uh, yeah, they, 
if I make some good equipment or some good clothing, it's uh, it was comfortable. Now we normally oh, wear. Oh yeah, for sure. Normally on a trip like that, we we all wear bunny boots. We wear shin shin pads. To, you know, kind of protects your knees and your lower leg, especially where your snowsuit gets kind of stretched tight against your knee. It helps to have the shin pad over your kneecaps. And then we, we wear tech vests and uh, motocross cross type helmets and goggles. It's kind of our standard thing. And then all of us carry, we just call them overcoats, but it's just a big jacket that goes on over everything else. So we don't normally wear that, but we carry it with in case you were to fall in the water or something. And then if it gets really cold, you can always just pull that out and quickly put it on right over your, I can put mine on over my helmet, over my snowsuit and everything. And it, uh, you know, it's like in Cane Quest where you're going day and night. I mean, you you might ride all day and in the evening when you're kind of sweaty and the sun goes down and it gets starts getting really cold it's nice to be able to put on something like that yeah yeah what about the um you know the the physical toll of riding that like the guys at your age like are, do you guys go to the gym or do you do you have a fitness regimen <laughs> i don't do it uh, i'm just fiddled in on and around and um various things uh it isn't the riding that is it was so hard. It was the lifting and walking through the slush and the deep snow. That's the real bugger, you know. And uh, Rex is an animal. He um, he's been doing that all his life, you know. And the uh, he can go trucking through that stuff. And um, he's got good wind, strong as a bull. <laughs> nice. He's a tough cowboy. Yeah. He er, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't wear that mustache for decoration. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's cool. Uh, they're, they're, they're making me sound pretty good. I'm not that tough. I just, uh, I just had probably a little more experience. Well, you're, you're tougher than me and Paul Rex. So, they, so you must be tougher than yeah. hell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I noticed how he commented on not being tough, but he didn't say that he wasn't as good looking as you guys <laughs> made him out to be. So we'll leave it at that. Um, Mike Galitz asked about the open face helmets. Like you said, motocross helmets. You're wearing the, the jaw, but you're wearing goggles with it. Why not a full face? What's the theory on that? Well, everybody's, well, I, di everybody's different, but I just haven't had good luck with them. I mean, you're we're on such a long ride in such a remote area. You can't, I mean, the electric face shield or something just, just doesn't work out. And if you, you know, you need something that's absolutely bomb proof. And, and it, that seems to be the setup. You know, if your goggles fog up, we have a spare pair of goggles. You can switch goggles in a, in a minute and be on the trail, but it's just simple and it works. So we had, I mean, we had climb helmets and climb goggles, and those those goggles fit in those helmets so nice. I, I, you know, I carry face tape in my jacket all the time, but I don't think I used a piece of it the whole trip. I mean, I just didn't have any air leaks, so. It, that, yeah, and the climb balaclavas are really the climb balaclavas are really good. Like I, I used to run one all the time before I got the oxygen, and uh, it's excellent. I think it's a climb Arctic is what the balaclava I ran was. You're, you you mentioned sponsors. Like when you started this, did you pursue sponsorships or did you start this out on your own and they just kind of flowed in as word got out? We started it out on our own and, and you know, word got around and we got a little help from, from a few sponsors. But, uh, you know, we, we self-financed this uh, probably – I don't know, 90%, I mean, 95, and we didn't get a lot of sponsorship. There there goes the pension checks and the grandkids' inheritance. <laughs> 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 and uh, I I talked to your wife, Rob, and she seemed happy about it all, so I don't know what that is. <laughs> She's pretty she good must have had a life insurance. She must have put the life insurance policy right up on you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Glenn Wheeler says, awesome way to go guys. That's great. Yeah. So no, it's a, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm quite a bit younger than you guys. I'm still an old guy, but I know what it's like to be, you know, when you get stuck or you're out in the slush and it's like, I, I don't, I'm not totally out of shape. I'm not in the best shape, but it's like, I can't imagine physically what you'd have to be going through as far as mentally as well. Like mentally does is, I mean, you've done Kane's quest and, and iron dog, which I mean, aside from that, they're the most grueling things mentally on the face of the earth. Does it, does it ramp up to almost that scale or was this a ride in the park? Oh, that, like the Iron Dog and Kane's Quest, that's a competitive type deal where you're under pressure to go, is, you know, get going and get there as fast as you can. So there's, there's a lot more pressure on you. On this one here, you know, you're just kind of going and you stop and dilly-dally around as need be. And it's a lot more, it's different than um, a competitive type race. Kind of the same nobody thing. told nobody told Rex it wasn't a race though. <laughs> oh, I, I wasn't no hurry uh, all the time. Once in a while. Yeah. Was <laughs> it, it enjoyable was, though? Like it like like I mean you have your 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 trials of course, but was it an enjoyable ride now looking back at it? Oh yeah, the the more I look back at it, the more amazing uh the, the more I enjoy it, you know, it was, it ended up being a well-planned out trip. Sometimes it didn't seem like it, but uh, it turned out to be, uh, you know, a real, a real special trip. It, uh, it was a lot of work. I, uh, speaking about being in shape, I, uh, I wasn't in shape. I lost 30 pounds <laughs> I wouldn't, during I wouldn't the ride 30 pounds to lose if I'd been in shape. So <laughs> really, but, uh, but we, uh, you know, we're, we're all very active. So, so we're in good shape and, and I don't know, you can go to the gym, but that, that don't, uh, I mean, that helps, but that don't really prepare you. I mean, that's just not, the same you know it a lot of it's mental you just got to put it in your head you know why turn around but it's probably easier going ahead than it is turn around so you know it, yeah it's, it was a lot of mental just you know keep going we'll be all right yeah i guess that's the thing with three of you is what was there ever a chance uh, an opera like was there ever a spot where one of you guys said i'm done like i'm get me out of here. I can't do this anymore. Like, was there ever that, did you ever get to that point or where two of you had to talk the other guy into it? Or was it, was it pretty much, you knew you had this goal and you were going to do it hell or high water? I think we all had the goal. I don't think there was any, uh, uh, there, there wasn't any having to talk to me and to keep it going. There was, there was times when we didn't know which way to go. I mean, like, <laughs> That McKenzie River is huge. It's two miles across. And there was times we didn't know which way to go or what to do, but there was no, there was, I mean, we might have. Oh, he froze up, I think. <laughs> do you know what he was going to say there, uh, Paul? Well, I think, you know, you could say, well, yeah, I've had enough. Get me out of here. Where, where the, where are we gonna get you out of here? Because there was no place. We're in the middle of the nowhere, you know. So <laughs> yeah, that's just, true. So we're just uh, nothing you can do. So you just gotta hang together and and hope for the best. That's all, the way it is, you know. Um, but we didn't. When we got to a village. There might have been one or two places where we could have got on an airplane or something that said "Adios, amigo." We're out of here. But um, so we all hung in there. That's great. Well, you're all smile. You're all smiling today, and we're gonna go through some pictures shortly. You don't look so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, well, we, funny. Well, well, go ahead. Hey, you know, we keep talking about the difficulties, and there certainly was plenty of difficulties. But at the same time, every day there was there was lots of moments where you'd 
you know, you just stop and look around and think, God, man, you, you know, this is beautiful. Or, you know, just, you know, the awesome experiences we had with people and the scenery and, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was more good than bad. Uh, of course, you, you, everybody wants to talk about the, the difficult things. So, you know, it's not there like, any, we, is there anything it's not that, like we suffered anything, the whole time. No, no. Is there anything that happened that makes you laugh still today? What's the funniest or what, what anecdote did you ever run into that, uh, that you still have fond memories of? Oh, I don't know. There was a lot of me that robbed and wrecked. They tried to starve me to death. I like <laughs> <laughs> so we were up there out of Fort Yukon someplace, and Rob says, yep. About an hour or two hours going to be there. And I thought, good, good. I'm ready for a good steak and a cold beer. Went around the corner. It wasn't a mile. And he, they were stuck. You know, But that was um, just part of the deal. You know, you just keep on going. And, and we, but we were shy on, you know, we, we had good grub along. You know, those sea packs or whatever we packed along. and uh, But it sure, it's nice to get a good meal. Beef turkey and granola bars gets old after a while. Yeah, that's right. And did you find that the locals uh, cooked you a lot, or did you have to fend for yourself sometimes? Well, they, we actually, we got to several different places. Uh, there was one up there in Fort Smith, I believe. I can't wait, but we had moose tongue. I've never ate it. And bear fat. They, the bear fat's kind of like lard. And they eat it like peanut butter, and it was pretty good, you know. And then we had um, going into some other towns. They 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 had like a community center or a school or whatever. They had whipped up some kind of stew or whatever. So we um, they were they were real good to us when we could when we could when we could eat. Nice. Listen, uh, do you guys want to get into some photos, or we're going to see some meals that you've had? We're gonna we're gonna see some fan photos to start to kick it off, and then uh, we'll get back into talking to you guys. How about that? Okay, sounds good. Okay, let's do that. I got one. People were bitching about the ads. I got one more ad to run, <laughs> and then uh, and then we'll get into the fan photos, and uh, we'll keep this conversation going. Fan photos are brought to you by Fast Track Snowmobile Traction. This season, quit sliding sideways on the ice and losing races to your buddies. A Fast Track stud kit will help you with improved braking and give you the arm-ripping acceleration you crave. I put over 3,000 clicks last season on my Renegade 850, and I'll tell you, these studs exceeded my expectations. Not one broken stud, my idle wheels still look like new, and they hooked up like I was on rails in the twisties, inspiring confidence every ride. Fast Track Top Gun kits are the highest rated stud kit at 4.9 stars with over 230 reviews. The studs are heat treated stainless so they are strong and they don't rust. The kit is lighter, easier on the track and has a lifetime warranty against breaking. Each kit comes with a track specific template for complete balance with over double the scratch lines from stock templates. All listeners when purchasing a stud kit can get a free install kit, a $30 value. Visit FastTrack.co, add both products to the cart, and use the coupon code SNOW at the checkout. That's F-A-S-T-T-R-A-C dot C-O. Nice. There we go. Just change the format a bit here. So, hey, announce about lodge sessions. We have four spots left in the main lodge Friday to Monday. It's $450 Canadian for the... Th Per person plus tax, of course, includes breakfast and dinner. So if you if you want to get in on this, it's two rooms left in the main lodge. We, there's rooms left in the tower. So if we have to put you in there, we can. But you want to be in the lodge where all the fun is. And uh, email me, Gary at mudbrats.com. Email me this week. Um, They're going to go fast. And uh, I thank everybody uh, that's uh, already pre-booked. And it's going to be a wild time. Uh, we got some new faces. We got some old faces, and the group for Wisconsin has uh, grown to six. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to to meeting some new faces there and hanging out again. So that uh, is a lot of fun. Yeah, guys, ever been to Sudbury, Ontario? 
I think we drove through there possibly on the way up to Labrador. You you might have, yeah, yeah. So a yeah. lot of some of the terrain looks uh, not unlike what you've uh, got in your photos. So it's pretty cool. So Whitetail Stables has to has to get on it and email me and get his room reserved because uh, if he doesn't, he's going to miss out and he's going to be crying in February when this comes around. So Nunzio, our friend, uh, the Polaris ambassador, he's on a road trip right now and he sent me this picture from Manitowoc. And look at that sign. They do it right there. You know? Isn't that wicked? No recalls on that boy. That's a Skidoo Rev right there. Arctic Mike sent me these and they they he sent me these at the end of the season last year. I think this was one of his last rides. Um, there he is posing on his Arctic cat with a snowman. And uh some sweet trails. If that doesn't make you want winter to come, I don't know what what will. And then this is a picture of the sled from the front. And there's a little sticker on the windshield you can see. And he blew it up there and he says, who else wants their wants the ass kicking? And it's Barney on it. <laughs> Did you guys have any motivational decals that you uh, you sported during the ride? I don't believe so. No, I seen one on the windshield with your names on it, but that's kind of boring. So, Mike Galitz, he sent us some pictures of uh, of what he's been doing on his channel over the summer. He's getting geared up for uh, for winter, and. Uh, He's hit a thousand subs, so congratulations, Mike! Uh, you earned it. This is uh, you're putting out some great con content, and you got some awesome bikes here. So uh, this is one of his gang rides uh, in the in the summer, and uh, there they are ripping the the CR 450s and the 500s. That's Mike way at the head of the pack there, I think. There they are wheeling. I think that was when they were doing the the shootout between the two new. Uh, 450s that he got one being a works edition there it is right there and then there's his, his vintage 500 in the top corner so good work mike you're building some nice uh some nice bikes there i knew all train tv would like that follow mike on uh, on youtube and check out those videos are pretty awesome kirk and penny sent this what are we looking at here paul <coughs> huh. i can't recall, but you know where I see that Z? Burke and Penny came down here during the summertime here a few years back on a run, and we went out to this place called Zorba's, and they have that old Arctic Cat machine on display, and I think that's where that is. Isn't that your yeah, first it is race Zorba's. Load? Isn't that your uh -huh. first race load, Paul? <laughs> My first what? Yeah. Your I first, that race be your sled. first racing sled. Yeah, actually, the first snowmobile that I ever drove, I think I drove one similar to that. It had wood uh, high facts underneath it. And I went over the top of some fence posts, I remember, and I sheared the grooves in the wood. That's about that same vintage, I believe. <laughs> so, did they have bogey wheels and then a, a, a thing of wood like behind the bogey wheels? Is that how they were? Nah, this was an old original Arctic cat, and um, they had some kind of a cleated track up underneath it. And it was, I think it was a skid frame of some sort, but then they had um, the track slid on boards underneath there instead of um, high facts. But this was back in the 60s, I believe. Yeah, that were... might even be older. Who knows? Like, that looks yeah. really very old. Just Fly Low wanted to know where you guys are from. That's a good question. I think I think Rex said where he was from. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm from Soda Springs, Idaho. I uh, that's kind of in the southern part of Idaho, pretty close to Wyoming border. What about you, Paul? Park. Oh, Rob. I'm from Park Rapids, Minnesota. Nice. And that's Zorba's in Park Rapids, somebody says. Well, I believe there's Sorry. one there, Rob. There. There's a Zorba's here, uh, actually, on the lake I'm on, but but I think that's one over at Paul's area. And then where are you okay. from, Paul? 
I'm from uh, Grand Rapids. Uh, I'm about 150 miles straight north of Minneapolis, St. Paul, about uh, 80 miles south of the Canadian border. But pretty much in the central of the state. Sweet. There's another question here. Did you guys wear any communicators uh, when you're on the ride, or did you just yell helmet to helmet? Well, we no, we don't because first of all, I can't hear, and uh, Rex can't talk, and the rod was kind of between. So we just uh, we've got uh, sign sign language we use. <laughs> the middle the middle finger fall in that as well. That comes in there. That's one of them. You got it. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down, or the middle finger. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Who who's this handsome devil? I can't remember. I think that looks think like our jeans. That that's you, yeah, yeah, for sure. Is this is this um is this Kane's quest? They're crossfires. Arctic cat. Yeah. Those were, that must be, I don't know, is that, it must be me, it ain't Rex. Yeah, no, it's you, definitely. I can see that for sure. Oh. Yeah. Is that's, that Kane's Quest our, then? Uh, Kane's Quest 2009 sleds. Nice. And Rex, he, like Rob said, you've got some accolades from that. Did you place in the top three? Did you win it? Did what? What are you? What are your sporting there for trophies? Uh, we went up there three times and we, we got a fifth and a third and a fifth. Uh, nice. Ju just finishing it is, you know, pretty pretty good accomplishment as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, that, that's a tough go. It's uh, especially you know we didn't have any sport crew and uh, kind of out of our out of our territory <laughs> and uh yeah so yeah we're pretty happy with the way that turned out for us now you got bud light and budweiser stickers were you sponsored by bud or is well, that just for I, fun back Always. in the day i was uh uh i was involved in a beer wholesaler ship and that's what we sold was um budweiser and bud light and paps and grain belt and a variety of different beers yeah, nice. <laughs> you uh, you probably needed that, or wish you had that sponsorship when you're uh, when you're doing the Alaska run, right? Oh yeah. No, Kirk. Kirk told me that this this is your Bearcats here. Uh, he said you guys just love the Bearcats. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, he they said were... you hated them. <laughs> yeah. They were uh, a little bit heavier than what we cared for, I believe. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I forgot about those things. Yeah. I won't take credit for that. When we decided to go up there, Rex says, well, maybe them Bearcats would be the thing to do, you know, and then one thing led to another and there we went. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. And and what is it you're on? The, what model Arctic Cat was? It was a... I want to say venture, but it wasn't a venture. It was a... When we went to Alaska? Yeah. No, Norseman. Called... Norseman. Nordsman. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is Jacob Massart. He's uh he's been sending pictures in of the a project he's been working on called Smart Leaf Spring. So you can see he's put C and A skis on his old 71, and he's got he's got leaf springs on his 2023 850 with smart shocks. And I, I said to him, where the heck did you get the skis? Did you make them? He said, no, they came off of a, uh, a ski boost. <laughs> Talk uh -huh. about confusing your smart shocks. <laughs> Do you think he has too much time on his hands, Rex? Oh, there, there is. All right. I don't know, out in deep snow, it might work pretty good. <clears throat> it, it, it might. They're pretty long compared to stock, I think. We'll have to get Jacob to comment on that. But that's his uh, secret project he's been working on for a while. 
But I love this. I think this is the coolest looking thing to have CNA pros on a on a uh, on a vintage. Hey, how? Boy, you see a lot of stuff. You go down that yeah. Haiti. It's amazing and the different things you see and what people do. That, I can't argue with that logic. Uh, look at look at it there. It just looks it looks so good with the skinny skis, huh? Super long, Jacob says. Yeah, that's cool. Now we're into your photos. This is good. So I, I only took out a few of them because uh, I'm sure there's stories with all of these things. So I'm just going to flip through them and and uh, we'll, we'll chat about them here. So this is a, is this a signed poster you guys were handing out here? Uh, it's just kind of a logo that we put together and uh, we we had it on some t-shirts and stuff like that, hats. So, yeah, I see this one's got your signatures on it. You'll have to mail me one of these. I'd love to. I'd love to have one for my collection. You know. Sure. So here's a map of uh, of Alaska, um, or is this a whole area? No, it's no, the Alaska. A, yeah, it's a Yukon Quest trail map. It's just one of the maps. You know, as we were planning the trip, we were finding all kinds of maps. And from Circle Alaska to Fairbanks, we were going to try to take that Yukon Quest Trail. So that's that's why we had that map. <coughs> you know, my, uh, Did, when we were planning the trip, I had maps stacked up all over the place. So you'd, you'd get bit, tidbits of information from lots of different sources. You found that really helpful, though, to have like a pre a predetermined route like this, like an explorer explorer route, and then you you could tweak it to make it your own. Well, we, I mean, yeah, we left home with it, you know, with a detailed route. I mean, we we had to have that because there's, I mean, you, we're pretty brave, but we don't just stumble off into the wilderness <laughs> not knowing where we're going to come out. So we definitely had a plan of where we were trying to go yeah yeah what kind of wildlife did you guys encounter through there was there anything really scary or was there anything really cool except this well, guy we didn't, see, we didn't see nothing on this trip um, we went to churchill we saw some stuff but we didn't see any wildlife I and mean, it's amazing that we didn't you know some of the yeah, areas that we yeah, that, that's the thing, and especially when you're breaking so much trail, you think you'd run into something, right? People would ask us that along the trip, and they, they thought we should have seen lots of game. And I don't know. When we went to Churchill, we saw quite a few things. This trip, I, you know, we saw a fox, a couple herds of caribou, but not, not much, really. Uh, yeah, that's, that surprises me a lot, right? You know? But maybe it was we, the chainsaws running all the time. Could be. We we seen a lot of evidence. I mean, we was on moose tracks and and uh, wolf wolf and lynx wolverine tracks everywhere. It seemed like just about. But I don't know. We just didn't. I think we was too busy looking uh, where we was gonna try to avoid getting stuck rather than looking for wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. Maybe it's a good thing you don't see the wildlife, right? When you're, when you're out with no, you know, nobody around and civilization so far away. So this is a great shot showing your uh, your gear. You know, you've got the the big fur line hood over top of that helmet. Um, your goggles are fill, like you said, filling the void of that climb helmet, and uh, you can see you're pretty airtight there. Yeah, that's that's an example of the overcoats I was talking about. We didn't wear them very much on that trip, but I don't know. That just happened to be a cold morning where I slipped it on for a while, I guess. Yeah, cool. Did, did you find yourself not wearing jackets once in a while? Like, I know you said you had tech vests that provide a little bit of warmth as well. Like, what it or is this kind of par for the course? Well, that. That's my overcoat. We didn't wear those very often. I think I only wore it two or three times during the whole trip. But but we always had our climb jackets on. But 
but the, those worked out yeah. pretty good for the most part. You know, you can control your venting and kind of wear it in a pretty wide range of temperatures. Yeah, sweet. This is your typical tool bench uh, preparing for the ride, is it? I wish Paul was here. He dropped out of the, he he froze up. So hopefully we'll get him back in the in the chat because this is pro oh here he comes. This is probably more uh, more to his uh, up his alley, right? Is this in Paul's shop? Yeah, that's in Paul's shop. And we when we were working on the snowmobiles, we would take that from sled to sled, and that kind of helped us determine what kind of tools we had to take with us on the trip. We Everything we did to the snow, we used the same tools. Yeah, right. And then, and then there's another variation of this. The next picture. <laughs> this looks like something more like you see in my garage. You know, everyone, everything just thrown up on top of the table, and then you've even got a broken hockey stick on there. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh... I'm sure that's a tool we're using for something. I don't know what. But. Yeah, who knows? Looks like it's pretty bashed up pretty good. You might have been pounding something out with it. Who knows? What? So when you take tools with you, are you packing them on your sleigh or did you send them ahead and head them at different stops along the way? We, did, we didn't send anything ahead. We carried everything with us. Uh, you know, you just never know when you're going to have a problem. Right. So is is that basically uh, just a small assortment of wrenches, a couple of power tools and, a, and you know, vice grips, mallet and, and duct tape? Is that kind of the, the, <laughs> the, the, the gist of what you packed? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, we would just roll that card around and, Paul's shop has two parts to it, and he just added on to it. So we were doing all this work in the new part, and whenever we went into the old part to get a tool, we just put it on that tray. And then before the trip, Paul took everything that was on the tray with us, so we had had the stuff. We didn't take a battery drill, but we took all the hand yeah, tools. Yeah, nice. Well, that's a good idea. That that's kind of a good idea because if you can fix it all in your shop on that cart. You know that's all you need the gist of it right did you pack some two-ply toilet paper as well just to get you through the the, the rough spots well, we had some toilet paper of course <laughs> and then the, the toboggan that we're seeing here did you make that yeah all three of us had uh homemade toboggans and they were all they were all slightly different, but similar. Uh, yeah. And, you know, they're kind of so, customized you, for what we were yeah, doing. Can you talk Can you talk to us about what how it works, like what the frame is? And we're looking at uh, some type of plastic on the top. Like, can you just go through kind of what that's, uh, what's that made of? Well, they're all made out of uh, UH, UHMW plastic, I think it's called with some runners underneath uh, it's a real popular sled out in Labrador and Kane's Quest racers use it quite a bit and uh, works out real good for us and they a lot of snow gets on top of them but it, the snow tends to fall off as fast as it gets on top of them so they work out real good for yeah. us it's almost like a hockey board or something like that that it's a slippery plastic so it just slides right off right it's a slippery plastic that is super durable i mean it's kind of like high fax material uh they're, they're really tough they work they work good and did you each carry like tow one of these behind the sled or was there one sled without a load no all three of us had sleighs with gas cans and uh, and i had all the food stuff on mine and Rex had the tent and the wood stove, and Paul had tools and parts on his. And I see some tubes in between these gas cans. What were they for? It looks like you there's want to talk a... about that, Paul. The what's that? There's there's little tubes between the gas cans here. 
I, that it looks was like there's like a plastic thing up there. So I think when it, I put made them so when you suck the cans together, they don't um, they stay pl square with the world, so to speak, and then they yep. suck the cans straight down. Rather, otherwise they want to tip in a little bit because the mogano still flex. You know, they go, going forward it flexes, but you get some side flexing on it also, and it's hard to hold things I, on. I bet, and there, so you've got eye bolts holding those straps on, and then that's just something to keep the the cans, you know, from pushing it. Right, you want to keep the stuff sucked down so it can't move around the best you can, because they, they get yeah, yeah. they get cans around back there pretty heavy duty. Do you lose much gas on the ride with it all shaking, or are they pretty sealed up? Well, we had a couple cans that got some um, steams broke on them. Um, and I think we have had some, we wore some holes in them with, um, I don't know, one time with a torsion spring or something one time. I can't remember which trip it was on. But uh, they're, they're actually a pretty good can you got to start out with a good can you know you can't have true it. true and um the ones that made up in canada i think rob had most of them and i think rex did too they, they're actually a better can thicker material yeah yeah nice and then you mentioned about the warm sleeping bags uh you're here's rob testing one out is he they uh they turned out to be a favorite for us <laughs> I mean, uh, we ended up sleeping in them a lot more than we thought we were going to. We were sure happy to have them. They were cozy. Yeah, and you mentioned that you were, you, you were counting on sleeping in a tent often, and you really didn't end up having to do that. Is that right? Well, not often. I thought we were going to have to sleep in the tent maybe three or four times, and we we weren't. We weren't on a camping trip. We didn't want to do that. Uh, and then, as it turned out, we only stayed in it one night. Uh, we found uh, shelter cabins or trapper cabins way more often than we expected. And they ended up being yeah. just a real blessing. And we, we enjoyed staying in those a lot. We have another question about the uh, why you didn't run four-stroke machines, and you mentioned that that Arctic Cat doesn't have a four-stroke that would do this. Was there any any thought of going to a Yamaha at the time, or? Well, I don't know. We're all pretty familiar with um, with the Arctic Cat. Uh, besides that, we had had six hundred Norsemen that we ran when we went up to Churchill, and we just. Felt pretty comfortable with that Arctic Cat machine. Uh, they're a good machine. They got a good motor in them, and uh, the, I think all the machines out there are good nowadays. But uh, so we just kind of went with what we're familiar with. Well, there's nice. And there's a, a trip like this is so long with with so many different conditions. It's it's really a struggle to you know what machine do you take. You know, when we were on the groomed trails, a four-stroke engine would have got way better mileage, wouldn't have burned any oil. But when we had everything stuck in deep snow and slush, four-stroke would have been heavier. Uh, everything is a trade-off. So, Yeah, and I don't think you want to be experimenting with a brand that you, you're not familiar with, right? Is that what it comes down to at the end of the day? Quite a bit of it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we got a we got a super chat from uh, Jacob Massart, and uh, he says, uh, "Any advice for a snowmobiler that wants to do a longer journey has never done it before?" Well, t take a second thought. <laughs> well, I, I see in his heading there it says nine ninety nine. Uh, that's not going to go far, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Well, yeah, he's he's been chipping away. He's buying 50, the rent. Not seventy. <laughs> <laughs> Do it when you're fifty, not seventy. Is that the thing? Well, he's got a few more years before he hits fifty. Yeah. 
I, I just think uh, is is it you guys are really experienced. Is it stupid for for a sixty or seventy year old to go, hey, these guys are this is interesting. I'm gonna do it. And they just head out. Is it is that stupid or do you think other people can do it at your age? I you know, I just think that there were so many years of snowmobile and experience that we've all had. It, you know, it just kind of comes into play, you know, um, like we put, you know, we allowed for the wind blowing, you know, we had two windshields on each machine, you know, you just sandwich them together and uh, the lights and it's just, there's a lot of knowledge that we kind of, you, you know, a lot, maybe a lot of people would have to write it down and we say, well, of course you're going to do that. And that's what I think, you know, it's just, um, I wouldn't want to go with a rookie. I'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah true. I think if somebody's starting out, you, you know, you just start, you go on an overnight or you go for two, three nights, you just kind of gradually work your way into it and, and you'll learn a lot. Uh, I think there's lots of other people that could do this trip. I don't think we're that special, but I, but I think it would be foolish for somebody that has never done it just to take off. You know, we were, you know, there was at times where we were a long ways from anybody, and you have to you have to have a little experience to do that. I think it'd be foolish to be inexperienced and just take off and be that far from any help. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So this is one of your pictures here. We're seeing it looks like no trail, lots of deep snow. And uh, it looks like you. This is one of your wood cutting uh, stops here. Yeah, that's that's on these old cat trails, and yeah, that it was difficult to follow the trail. And then even when you were on the trail, there was all a lot of logs across it. it. It was just really difficult. I mean, you don't really think about the fact that. You know, like a forest fire goes through the area, and then the popple trees come up so thick. Or where a windstorm blows all these trees down, it, it, it was just a real, very slow going. I can imagine. This shot says it all, you know, like this, you think about going across a lake, you know, smooth and flat. And then you look at this picture and there's ice chunks drifting everywhere, you know, and you're pretty far away from the uh, the shoreline there. Yeah, that, you know, that doesn't look so bad there. We're, what really surprised us is on these bigger rivers like the Mackenzie. It seems like everything freezes up in that country and you get 10, 12 inches of ice. And I don't know what happens. Personally, I think water kind of quits flowing. So the water in the river goes down like, like eight feet. And all the ice caves in crumples up, washes downstream, and freezes. And when it refreezes, they, they call it broken ice. The whole river is just a mess of chunks of ice sticking up, and it's extremely hard to pick your way through there. So you wouldn't of, have to, and you wouldn't be able to go any speed on this because you don't really know what's on the other side of these chunks, right? Well, yeah, you, you know, it's... It's a little different than, the, you know, a Saturday afternoon ride. I mean, we, we know we're in remote areas. You've got to protect your equipment and try to strike some kind of a balance between making progress and not breaking anything. Yeah. I, I know there was another question there about your uh, your, your GPS and in-reach and spot. Did you have to carry a satellite phone or anything like that? Like, did you have cell connection the whole way? No, we, we definitely didn't have cell connection at all. But the, the InReach and the Spot, I mean, the two different brands, Garmin InReach and Spot is a separate brand. But both of those communicate through the satellite ne network like a satellite phone, but you can only send text messages. Uh, oh, so okay. we had the ability to send text messages to home. And it also sends out a... You know, every so often, I think I had mine set at every half hour, it would send out a, a dot on a map 
so our families could look at a map on their computer and see where we were. And by, by looking at the dots popping up, they could kind of get an estimate of if we were making good time or you know, they could see us doubling back or what, what was happening. So, yeah. yeah, we have some pictures on that too, which is pretty cool. Uh, was there any time during the trip that your loved ones were worried about you at all? The, the, was there any reason to be concerned? Oh, I think there was. Because I know my wife, one time she got a hold of, um, I, I hadn't been in touch with her for about four or five days. She just wanted to hear my voice. Um, but I think there, you know, that can happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I It's almost like you guys are like the Buzz Aldrin and, you know, the first moon explorers kind of thing, right? You're going out, you have limited communication and, you know, you're, you're hoping for the best. <laughs> Mike Galitz asked, uh, what, do you know what your average speed was through the whole time? Oh, boy. I would say yeah. we, we couldn't tell you because some places we could roll along pretty good, um, you know, up in the 70 mile an hour range or more. And then a lot of times we were probably two, three, four mile an hour, if that. So it depends upon the wow. terrain. Yeah. And you mentioned your track. They're not studded, right? You're running just big paddles, correct? No, we had studs in them. We had uh, woody studs, which actually worked pretty good. They're uh, long. We put them in the belting. They weren't they weren't studs that went on the on the rib. They make those also, but uh, these were regular good sized studs that go in the belting. Like we had put two every other bar. Yeah. So what what depth of paddle was on the track? The paddle was like one point. They you know, about an inch, a little bit over an inch and a half high. Oh, okay, they, so you're running about a one seven five stud or something like that. Yeah, a little bit higher than the, the paddle, whatever it was. Yeah, this is a good shot showing your uh, your double windshield that you riveted on, and the uh, and the the Garmin GPS that you've got running there, um, which is pretty cool. But it looks like you're on a groomed trail here. So is this closer to home? Yeah, that would have been closer to home. That looks like a groom trail. Uh, that's my sled. I I just put that extension on my windshield. Uh, Paul and Rex actually had a second complete windshield on their snowmobile. And the, the reason we do that is in case somebody crashes and breaks a windshield, you could take one off the other sled and replace yours. Oh, I got gotcha. you. That's good. good thought. Was there ever any any risk of you crashing? Was there any close calls or anything like that? Uh, I don't think so. We twisted up an A arm on Rex's, but that was just slow going, you know, hit a tree or whatever. But we didn't have um, like a high speed crash or anything because we we weren't going that fast like that. Right. Right. You, and and you want to last the whole ride, right? You uh, oh, yeah. you didn't have a time limit. You need to finish this in, and the idea was to keep everything in together as long as you yeah. could. Yeah. This is another. Is this the same river that we seen earlier here? Boy, I'm not sure. It looks like it is. Yeah. I mean, that's an example of broken ice. You, you know, those are. It's covered with snow, but there's ice chunks all over out there. Yeah, if that's my wife calling, I'm not here. <laughs> Speaking of phones, here we are. Well, you're at some remote station. What we? <laughs> this is this is the Canadian uh, border. Uh, the heated house. That's if you're coming into the United States. The phone outside in the cold. That's that's. That shows how tough the Canadians are. They just figure you can stand out in the cold and make this phone call to get across the border. That, so you had to phone to get clearance, did you? Yeah, yeah, That that's a remote crossing there. And uh, you just uh, call in and tell them your plans and they give you a number. And uh, then if there's any questions, you just give up that number and... Uh, 
uh, uh, that tells them where you crossed and uh, all your information, I suppose, if they want to dig into it. We, we had no problems with the borders or anything. All that stuff went really smooth. And how cold did it get? Like, what kind of temperatures are you guys riding in? Oh, we've we seen a lot of 20 below in the mornings and evenings. But we had a lot of, I mean, that's that's not super cold. I mean, we didn't have any super cold weather. And we had a lot of days it was, uh, oh, it got up around zero. It was It was pretty pleasant as far as temperature on this trip. So it wasn't it wasn't crazy that nothing you guys couldn't handle. We no, all that, through, the we wind went, is the best. We went pretty late in the year, mainly because we wanted longer days, more daylight, and it also made it warmer. And it's it's the land of the midnight sun, so was there much dark? I think uh, that I think time of year, the, about 50 50. I, I, oh, I was think, it? I think we had so you did about 12 hours of daylight. And then, when what did you have a rule that you wouldn't ride past a certain time of day, or did you ride until you couldn't ride anymore each day? Oh, <laughs> it just depended if, if you know, we, tr we tried, we didn't end up riding in the dark too much i mean we tr definitely tried to avoid it and uh if we seen a cat two or three hours a day but we seen a good cabin or uh, you know uh or, or or got to a village we didn't press on we uh we'd take the you know we'd take that you know one one the gift uh, horse you you take what? the gift horse early that day if yeah. you have. Yeah. <laughs> We'd take one in the hand instead of three in the bush. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. You, there is a lot of unknowns if you keep going. You don't know what's open. You know, even if you got to another town, was there things open? Like, it, it's, when you roll into these small villages, is, is are they ghost towns? Uh, no, but but, like, there's just certain hours you can get uh, gas, you know, like they don't sit at the gas station all hours and, and you know, all the villagers know, okay, if you need gas, you better get down there at this time of day, you know. But I think there was one village we ended up paying a, a, a late fee, you might call it, we had to pay to have somebody come down and gas us up because because it, it wasn't real late at night, but we wanted to get an early start, and the gas station didn't open till the next day at eleven o'clock or some. You know, there was there was some of that kind of logistics that we had to work out. And I think there was one time we we ended up paying a pretty handsome fee for a, to get filled up with gas at night. I think we did wow. that. I think we did that twice. You know, these towns only have you know, two, three hundred people. So they can't afford to have somebody sitting at the gas station all day for the amount of customers they have. So they would, the gas station would be open from, you know, like 10 in the morning until one in the afternoon. Well, we come in late at night, leave early in the morning. So it was a problem for us. So a couple of times we had to pay somebody to come down and open up. And typically we, we would get gassed up the night before so that we could get up and leave in the morning but when you when you talk about where we would stop at the end of the day often these towns were uh, you know these towns are so small they might not even have a, a place to stay and they might be a hundred miles apart so if it was anywhere close to the end of the day you know you'd stay at that town instead of trying to make the next one yeah yeah and as far as your fuel stops go, premium fuel's got to be of a scarcity, is it? I don't think they even know what it is up there. We yeah. Just burn whatever so how did you, 
you just put you put whatever they're pumping. Yeah. You, you don't have a lot of options. <laughs> no. Couple, no. The, the motor's got a knock sensor in them. And it's like if you get poor gas, I don't know if it's poor gas, but low octane or whatever it is, there'd be a code would come up on the, I think it retards the timing on them automatically so you don't lose your motor. Uh, but that happens several times um, when we get some of these remote gas stations. You, you burn whatever they got because that's all you're going to do. Yeah, no, that's that, that, that's always a, a concern when you're recreational riding, right? But uh, here's your deckle, Paul Dick. The three old guys ride to Alaska. That's awesome on the front of the sled. Yeah, I think Rob or Rex made them up. Much nice. Little... And, and tell me about that light. Moment. Yeah, double windshield. And tell me about that light. Did you guys make that? Well, actually, Rob got those. I forget the brand name on them, but um, they work pretty good. A lot of the stock lights on a lot of the machines just don't, they aren't as bright as we'd wish. And, um, these here really brighten it up, um, especially like in, um, you know, even in the fog, it kind of brightens it up a little bit. Yeah, it's a clever idea how it's right in the bottom of the windshield uh, molding, too. Really nice. You know how many lumens that thing was? Boy, I can't remember. It was pretty bright. Friggin' bright? <laughs> yeah. Now this looks like the white moon. What are we looking at here? Well, out of order with the pictures, it's kind of hard to tell, but I think that's great. Oh, it's, light, we are, probably. yeah, we are way out of order on the pictures. And when I download them from Facebook, they just end up with some random name and I just, I, I'm not sure what I'm putting them into, but that might be great slave lake. You think? Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of amazing. You look at all this stuff at home on the map, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah, we'll just go across this lake or just go down this river. When you get there, it's like, wow, this is a big country up here. Yeah, yeah for sure. A couple real big lakes. Uh, Great Slave Lake and then that Lake Abbasca was, that was real big too. That could be that lake too. Could be. It was, we went 200 miles across Lake Athabasca. 200 miles. That's a, the, did you feel lonely out there? <laughs> we were in a lot of lonely places. <laughs> I can't, I, there's a, there's a lake up north called Talon Lake that I don't know how many miles it is, but it's, it's a, it's a fraction compared to that. And, I feel like by the time I get to the end of it, I'm ready to be off the lake. You know, it's like, get me to a trail. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, there's another there's another shot of the sled on the trail. Now, those skis, are they, are they, are they factory for the Nordsman, or did you have uh, aftermarkets? No, they're, uh, they come with, they come with that, that ski. That's a stock ski on that model. Yeah. Oh, th that's great. Good flotation and everything like that. And they are 137 tracks. Are they longer than that? Oh, they're like the 153 or 154. Yeah, nice. That would be a great sled then for this. And here we are cutting wood again. So you said there was a whole day of this, of just, you know, Stop and cutting, moving a bit more, stop and cutting. Well, there was more than that. There was, uh, I don't know, what did we spend in there? Three, four days? I think we spent four really? days in that uh, in the stretch between Flint Lawn and, uh, and South End, South End of Reindeer Lake there. You know, that was, that was as soon as we got off the trail system, we ran into that. And I think all of us were thinking, if it's like this all the way to Alaska, we're never going to make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you, you obviously camped in a tent out there, did you? 
in in that stretch we did yeah and Any we were problems? hoping to get we were hoping to get through the next town and we just couldn't make it so had to double back and camp yeah there, there was any problems stretch. with fire go ahead there, rex there was another stretch we didn't get <clears throat> we didn't get very far and we was uh we we, we knew we was going to be low on gas so we had to go back and get gas and uh, go back in and hit it again and any problems making fire or or food or anything like that when that was, you're out in the wilderness like this well it's not that? the same as uh sitting down in a nice restaurant <laughs> but but we you know we had food with us so it was all right who's the chef of the group i would say rob's the chef and is he I'm not really a chef, but I can heat water up. That's kind of what we were doing mostly. He, he, he made some great, he, he come up with some great freeze dried meals. Just add water and heat it up. Let us hit a minute. That, and, and did you make them yourself or did you buy them freeze dried like that? You actually prepared them yourself? No, they was, they was bought and, you know, the, the, kind of like the army MRIs or whatever they call them yeah yeah so that's the thing you want to pack that stuff so it's light and doesn't take much room right yeah and, and just takes water to prepare you know you can pour the hot water in the in the package you know and it just prepares itself right in the package that it comes in yeah yeah so this looks like a warming hut or is this someone's house that you're at that's a that's a that's Go Tommy Bird cabin there, and that's that's Tommy Bird in the. Uh, and Paul bought a set of mittens from him. He makes he he's a famous dog sled musher. Uh, he okay. He's, he's raced all over the world. In fact, we got to talking. He'd raced down here in my hometown in Idaho. He he's a very interesting guy. He's and uh, he uh, makes these real nice mittens and different stuff and uh takes them to the dog sled races and and sells them you know it's kind of helps uh i think it's what he what he does helps you know pay for his trips and stuff i think paul bought yeah i set. see that I mean, <laughs> paul's wearing them it, it looks yeah, great it, in the photo i'm good yeah did you, did you know him before the trip, or did you run into him? Is this one of the characters that you you picked up along the way? Oh no, he's he's just the first. He's one of the. He's kind of the one that got uh, kind of got the ball rolling. I mean, we just yeah, he one come out to meet us on the lake there at the South End, and uh, he uh, he's kind of the one I think that the. Kind of kept transferring the start start transferring the message ahead of us, you know. And uh, yeah, it ended up he was a big help to us. I think a real big help. That's great. Yeah, he he had, was one of the guys that escorted us in the South End, and then he went on his Facebook page and and just put a message out to the First Nation people to to try to help us out on our journey and. I think that made a difference all the way through our trip. I mean, uh, it seemed like after that town, every time we'd roll into these little towns, people would know who we were. And a lot of times they'd have some supper for us and take care of us. And it was really, really helpful. Everybody was trying to help us on our journey. That's really good. You need that support uh, group for sure. And then this this lake, do you recognize this lake or river that you're on here? And it, it looks like you're blazing a trail. <laughs> I think we got hundreds of miles of that type of running. <laughs> I don't know what lake that is. A river it looks like a river, I believe. Yeah, that looks like a river. Look, I'm not sure where, but looks like Sudbury. <laughs> nice and uh, nice and smooth right there. Yeah, actually, it's very flat, isn't it? 
Where are you at? Was there ever was there ever any, any concern of going through the ice, or you're doing it at a time of year where you know it's thick as as it needs to be? No, there was always a concern, uh, at least on my part. I'm not used to being on big rivers and uh, lakes out here in my neck of the woods, so I worried about it quite a bit. I don't know about the other two, but uh, you know, it seems like we don't have any pitch. Yeah, Rich froze up there. Yeah, there that's okay. He 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 seems to come back, so yeah. we'll uh, we'll just trudge on, so to speak. <laughs> There's we, another. We that's all, another wood path. We were all real careful because I mean, you never know about ice. I mean, it's it doesn't matter how cold it gets. There's always a possibility of you know getting in a rapids or something. So you have to be as careful as you can be. Did you do anything to test ice thickness or river crossings before you went, or you just kind of went slow and let Rex lead? Well, a couple <laughs> of times. Some of the guys would say, when you, there was a, some of the locals that helped us, they'd say, when you get to this, this spot here, make sure you go on the north side of the river, the south side, or whatever it is, and stay away from the rapids. Um, so we did get a few pointers from some of the guys um, out of um, Old Crow, I believe, and um, maybe even farther up, I can't recall. Yeah, good. It's always nice to have the inside local knowledge, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, is this a mod you did before you left here, uh, Paul? That looks to me like well no that was that's in my shop here i believe and what happened was we had four of these same snowmobiles and we put out about 1100 miles on one of them testing shocks and tracks and gears and etc and then we took that one all apart and brought along all the components along with us but so uh, you had actually a you had actually a sled broken down that you were using for parts Right. It was new wow. when we started. And then well, we, uh, not the whole sled. Just, uh, the, no, that's right. But, but you're talking clutch. and well, What are you holding there? It looks like a skid plate or some. Uh, I can't that's remember. A, that's an aluminum cover that goes over the ECU. Oh, I okay. Think we're probably pulling the ECU out of it or something. Wow, that's cool. Did you ever have to rely on, did you have to use any of those parts? Yes, we did. Yeah, what, what kind of what kind of things did you have to replace? Well, we used the clutches because we were hard on clutches. We used the A-arms because uh, we were hard on them. We blew um, the front ski shocks out on them. Um, and we actually had some stuff shipped up there. Uh, one of my kids was pretty familiar with snow machines. He used to work at Articat. So he rustled up some start parts up there in some of the rural areas. And I can't remember where they shipped them up there to us, but we put them on. Um, as well as Articat shipped some skis, I believe. We smoked out three sets of piece of those dually Woody's runners. They're pretty durable, but we were hard on equipment. Wow. That's see, that's things that people wouldn't think about, right? Like to actually take a snowmobile and take all the major, you know, wearables off of it and carry them along just in case. You know, if you didn't do that, you'd be with three guys, and if one sled goes down, you, you you're you're pretty much done for the ride, aren't you? Well, yeah, and that's why and we all had three of the same machines, and it's and you can't count on uh, parts, you know. Even the availability in in a perfect world down here, so you almost gotta plan ahead and take along what you might need. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I've never seen a Nordsman on the trail or anywhere in my travels, so I can't imagine trying to find parts for it. If you, you know, that's, if that's you needed the to Norseman pinch. guys are way out in the bush. <laughs> well, yeah, true, right? True. Yeah. I know. 
See, yeah, see, this is one of those photos that I said you don't look quite as happy as you look right now. <laughs> <laughs> is this at the end of one of your log cutting days, or what are we looking at here? I'm not sure. Well, so under your helmet, you didn't wear a balaclava or anything? You just wore the goggles there? And that was I typically enough? did. I don't know why it wasn't that day. Maybe I just had my helmet off for something. I don't know. But when typically we did. Them days, uh, it was we were sweating like no other. I know I didn't have my belt top on for you know during the work when we was really working hard. It was just too hot. You know, yeah. It's just one thing to try to put on and off between when when you stop to cross more trees or whatever you know so I, I'm, I'm guessing that was when we was in the woods maybe or i'm not sure but yeah yeah well i think if you're minus 20 and you're talking fahrenheit right not celsius yeah. so you're very cold and this looks like a, a is this an ice road or is this just a regular highway you're on here that's a that's the very end of the trip going from Circle, Alaska down to Fairbanks. Our original plan was to take the Yukon Quest route. And by then we were down to two machines. Everything was pretty wore out. And the locals told us there had been a couple of big storms through there. And that following that Yukon Quest route would be, they thought it would be almost impossible. And they advised us to just take the road down into town, which which we did. And I mean, you can see the road is very similar to a snowmobile trail here. I mean, it was, it didn't look like road, but. Yeah, it's a, it looks like it would be a nice ride, you know, on there, nice, smooth, and not really too much uh, can go wrong on that. The Arctic Ocean. Was this a big milestone for you at this sign? I think your mic's covered up there, uh, there, Rex. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yep. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, north of Inuvik, about 150 miles. It's uh, a little village called. Tuck Toya Akatuck. They just call it Tuck for short. <laughs> that means right. caribou. That means caribou see the caribou. <laughs> nice. But, uh, <laughs> kind of kind of an interesting uh if you go in, it's it's a long ways to the North Pole from there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're you're see, getting I'm pretty north. Away, probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You guys look like you're a little chilly there. Uh, Glenn Wheeler asked a good question. He says, what happened to the sleds when they completed the trips? Did you ship them back to the States? Arctic had helped us out with that. We we took them to the dealership in Fairbanks, and Arctic had had them uh, shipped back to Thief River Falls for us. So that was really oh, helpful. That's, that's nice. So they, they really gave you a lot of support. Yeah, the, the sleds almost beat us home. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Did you have to do a lot of celebrity appearances and stops on the way home to talk about the trip? Or were you guys pretty much done and going, I'm going home? I, I think when we got into um, Fairbanks, there was, um, there was a, a bunch of snowmobile guys and there was some, I think there was a TV or radio station came down and talked to us a little bit also. Um, so they knew we were coming and, um, but that was pretty much just the one day, I believe. And then there was a lot of people at the hotel that we were staying at for a couple of days after they'd say, Hey, are you one of the old guys and blah, blah, this and that. And, uh, so that drug on. And then we were actually stuck up there for a couple of days. That's when they had a big, um, some kind of volcano or something over in Russia. And there was a bunch of smog in the air or whatever, so they shut the airplanes down. Oh, no. 
You ever thought about up. riding back? Did you? <laughs> no. That's not, probably what we should have done. Not for very long. <laughs> <laughs> that's mm. that's the next trip. So what? It, I don't know which one. It might be Paul under the bumper here. What were you doing on this shot? I Side can't. panels off. I'm, I'm guessing this that's a, when my uh, that's probably when my sled caught on fire. Uh, oh, kind of looks to me like we we're trying to take the the hood off to try to assess the damages on my sled there. Um, so what happened? Was it a fuel issue, or or what? What would cause it to go on fire? Well, this was just north of Flint Flon when we first started going through all those brushy trails, and I. I was just going down the trail and there was a dead pine tree that just a kind of a freak thing. The end of that pine tree just stabbed into one of the vents on my hood. And by the time I stopped, it had broken off and I, the snowmobile was running fine. So I just pulled the stick out, threw it over my shoulder, and forgot about it. And then about an hour later, we had a kind of a hard pull across the lake, stopped on the other side of the lake to determine how we were going to get over the next, through the next portage so to speak. And we looked back at my snowmobile and it was, it was on fire. And Paul and I went ran over, started throwing snow on it. And Rex had already started riding a snowmobile, but he's noticed it and circled back and he had a fire extinguisher that he could stick under the hood and put the fire out. But a, a piece oh, of that's, that stick. That's lucky. Yeah. I mean, it was just a weird thing. A piece of that stick had, broke off and was laying right on the Y pipe of the engine. So when I went across oh, that geez. lake, it must have got hot enough to ignite it. And it melted a hole through the air box and burnt a hole up through the hood of the snowmobile. So did you, did you, I think we're going to see pictures of that, the air box mod and things like that, right? Yeah, we had to, you know, we weren't that far from Flin Flon. So we circled back to Flin Flon and, Stayed overnight there again and went over and bought some supplies. And I, you mentioned like uh, Apollo 13. That's the way I thought it was. We were laying there with a bunch of odds and ends laying on a, on the hotel bed and looking at that hood thinking, <laughs> okay, how can we fix this up? So I love it. Being, the, you know, racing backgrounds and stuff, you're probably no stranger to MacGyvering, you know, sleds back together to, to, finish the day right yeah but you know we were the problem was we had another you know at that point we had i don't know 3500 miles to go so it's it, you know you, you have to make a repair and you have to make one that's gonna hold together yeah yeah oh for sure and then this is before you left you're you're happy and you're warm and dry and yeah, you can tell that's before the uh, the weight loss program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you lose? Did you all lose weight during the ride, or? Uh... I, I lost twenty pounds. Rex is thirty. What about you, Paul? I lost ten. Ten, nice. That's great. It wasn't planned that way, but that's the way it worked out. No. Well, who? who... Uh, so I can just tell my wife it's my fitness regime is just take long rides then. Yep. Right. Yeah. These sleds look, familiar. look, what was that? Get familiar with um, jerky, granola bars and water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. So I know you probably pooped it all out then is what you're saying, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these uh snowmobiles look amazing on the lake they really do you know there was lots of tough days but there's lots of days like that right there i mean does that look like beautiful riding or what you know it's just nice it does it does like nice sunny day and you know it doesn't look like there's any wind that day it just is uh yeah it'd be a fun fun day and with your with your two buddies you can't beat that right pretty awesome yeah, I, I take it this is before the ride too. You got the bench there, rolling it between the snowmobiles. And were you careful to whatever you did on one, you did to the the others, or how did you how did you make sure that 
that, you know, everybody was going to be on the same playing field. We pretty much have, we pretty much built them all three the same. Um, you know, basically, um, they had the electronics on Rob and Rex were wired in a little different, but they're pretty much the same shocks, the same gearing, the same clutching, and everything was the same on all of them. Did you burn through many belts? Uh, excuse me, belts? Yeah, belts. Like, uh, boy, the, surprisingly, the we didn't. Um, we we changed them at about the halfway mark, just just as a maintenance item, but we didn't have any trouble with them. Yeah, that's good. When you talk about clutches going, you'd think that they would take a belt with it too. Well, it, we did. We did lose them when the clutch went. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Did you have a belt sponsor come on board, or are you running factory belts on it? We had factory belts. Right on. See, it's good to see what these these uh, these art cats will go through in a day, right? Hard day of riding. This is an amazing shot. What are we looking at here? I think that's a trail from Fort McPherson towards the Richardson Mountains. Uh, you, you roughly follow a creek up to its headwaters, and this is the early parts of that. I mean, just beautiful, you know. Beautiful. I mean, we had, we had lots of days that were just, you know, beautiful, nice riding. You're making it sound too good. <laughs> There's another shot from the lake. Now you're not running knee pads on the console. Uh, you're running. You said you had you had them in your pants. Did you in your snow pants? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Here's this. Go ahead. I, I like to run them in my in the pants, regular shin pads. That way, you've got them when you kneel down to work on a snowmobile or anything else. It, it just works good for me. Yeah, that's awesome. And here's the stick uh, shown here, laying on your your exhaust. Yep. So you didn't realize that that had poked through. You thought it broke off and it was free when you threw it threw it over you, right? Yeah. Well, I saw it, you know the four foot long branch had stuck in there, and I when I pulled it out, I didn't realize that the last whatever eight ten inches of it were had broke off underneath there. I didn't know that was still in there, so that's what caused the problem. Yeah. Wow. And there's the hole melted through. Is that your air box there we're looking at? Yeah, it's a, you know, the way the machines are made now, that, that's molded, you know, pretty precision molded to fit over the motor. So if you look to the left, you can barely see we've got the hood off one of the other snowmobiles sitting there. And so we're looking at the, at a good one and we're looking at mine, trying to decide how we can uh, patch it together. Oh, there's more pictures coming of that. I thought I had them in, in order as we go along here. But, yeah, it's uh, the, the job you did is pretty cool. Is this that same pass we were talking about earlier? No, this is another place. Is, is this actually – is this a video or is that just a snapshot? It's just a snapshot. I don't think there's any other videos in there. I don't think they came across. That's a spot where uh, – that's on the Porcupine River, and there was another river that came – into it at that point on the other side and the locals had told us you have to have to stay on the right hand side of the river really tight because the the other river that comes in is a little warmer water and it's moving faster so there was open water out in the middle there they had told us the ice was pretty iffy there so we were trying to stay right against that bank that's pretty a smart idea and i bet you it's Place. With those high banks, I'm sure it's not shallow. I'm sure it's pretty deep. It's called the ramparts, and they those high banks went like I don't know about 40, 50 miles of the river were like that. Really beautiful to ride through. That's awesome. 
There's your buddy again. Yeah. He must have been good for some stories. You guys remember and, that? And that's the first day. That's the first day. Everything was working right? really good. We were pretty optimistic at that point. We're about an hour from Paul's house, I think. <laughs> Thinking, let's go. You got a we pretty got good this. Depth, Rob. <laughs> well, I see a fence line there. I don't know where that is, but uh, there's some kind of a thing there. I could, that's why I remembered it. There's like a elm tree thing there or something. They got the trees fenced in. A nice, smooth, groomed trail. Gotta love that. Is this at one of your houses? There's a snowmobile trailer there. Or is this a camp along the way? That's it's my house, I believe, isn't it? Yeah, that's your shop. Yeah. Could be, yep. Okay. Quite the winter wonderland there. Snow ghosts in the trees and beauty more river riding hugging the banks like you said right there'd be less ice chunks uh, near the shore as well yeah sometimes that was the best to go on the edge but it was it changed all the time you had to kind of thread the needle trying to find the best way up these rivers did you guys get along well as far as making decisions and, and, you know, not arguing about, you know, this is wrong or this is right. Or did you, did you, did you kind of decide all to agree on the same thing? I just pretty much left it up to those guys. I just, I just kind of went whatever I said, wherever, whatever. And they kind of worked. That's it out. good. Awesome. None of us can hear. So, so if somebody complains, uh, you know, if, if you tell somebody, quit getting stuck, he just says, no, I got enough gas. And the third guy says, I'm not hungry. And, and we get along pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's windy. Yeah. There's open water there. I had hamburgers on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It seemed to work for us. I, I mean, we we basically lived together. I mean, shared beds, shared hotel rooms, and uh, we never had a problem. We all got along real good. Yeah, you guys. Sure, I'm sure everybody bit like their you. lip at one time or another, but it, it was all great. Yeah, yeah. This looks like a nice road. Yeah, nice, yeah. nice cruising. Yeah, and big high snow banks. Like, that's deep snow. What's the deepest snow that you encountered over the run? Oh, boy. I couldn't tell you. I mean, up there uh, by the Richardson Mountains, like when we were stuck, it would be well up to underneath arm Rex's armpits. And he's a tall really? man. Yeah. yeah. Just one of the dealers that supported you along the way. It's the Fairbanks Articat dealer where we brought our sleds at the trip. At, did you say at the end of the trip? Yeah, that, that was right in Fairbanks. So we we brought our snowmobiles there, and they had kind of a meet and greet for us there one day, and uh, then they arranged to get the snowmobile shipped back. Great guys helped us out a lot. And this will give everybody an idea what you hauled on the sleighs. So the white jugs, were they water? No, they were, everything was gas. That was all gas. Wow. And a couple of big bins and tarps and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Well, Rex had, he had a, a tent, a cook stove or tent and a wood burning stove for the tent. 
and some canvas and various things in in that big box probably what you're referring to there yeah yeah and then i had um rob had a couple of big duffels with the food and other things and i had a lot of the parts and on my noggin as well as my machine then plus we all had a a back you know a, a personal pack on the back of our machines so that we could take that off just you know if we were going to stop for just a short jaunt um easy off easy on type deal yeah what do you think the total weight was that uh, if you if you factored in the snowmobile and its pack and the sleigh and all that it's good that's on it what do you think the weight was that you you had there combined on one unit boy i don't know we got to be up there i'd say right around 11 1200 pounds i believe time you get all the stuff and then if and then if it's really bad if you pick up a lot of slush you know when it was cold it would get up and get on top there and freeze and so it's not hard to pick up you know 50 pounds of frozen slush Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Scott's General Store, Stony Rapids Snowmobile Center. That was a great guy. Let us, uh, we got in the Stony Rapids and we, he let us take our machines into a shop overnight and thaw the ice and slush and stuff off them and and we greased them up and kind of gave them a once over inside a shop. That was, that was really helpful. That's very nice of them to do that. Uh, Mike Leitz wants to know if you know how much gas you went through on the whole trip. <laughs> I don't know. And I don't really want to. <laughs> a lot. You don't want to <laughs> nine dollars a gallon we kind of just put that on the back, <laughs> back wow there. we didn't think about yeah. it too much <laughs> yeah wow yeah that's the same uh, i think that's the same crossing but deeper in to that uh that little area along the river and you can see a flat area of the water it's probably where the weaker ice is where the flow is you didn't really have much shoulder to ride on alongside those cliffs, did you? No, we're trying, you know, trying to stay out of the broken ice and not in any rocks on shore and not fall through the ice. It got a little narrow in there. Yeah. Is that where you're damaging skis and A-arms is in places like this? We did. I think the A-arms was in a tight spot before we got the river was. Um, it was a tree, I believe. It just could barely get through. Um, yeah, the only the only damage yeah. we done to the A arms was I had a I got a ski on the wrong side of the tree. And, oh no! You know, all that all that weight, you know, just it weren't bent real bad, but it was it was crooked. It was hard to steer and stuff. But uh, but the skis. Uh, they just, you know, here and there was hitting gravel and rocks, and it just it wore them out. I bet, right? You you can have the the greatest carbides in the world, and you're still hitting plastic on rock in that situation. There was a few times where we were on winter roads that it would it would look like a snowmobile trail and would be great for miles and miles, but then you'd hit a section where it would be just gravel and you just, you couldn't just jump off it on the side. I mean, there'd be high banks and trees and stuff like that. So all of a sudden you'd be going down a stretch that's just gravel and it would, it was hard on equipment. Yeah. This looks like an Alaskan town that we're looking at here. It's in uh, Fort Resolution. Uh, it's on Great Slave Lake. We pull, I mean, that's a very small First Nation community. We pulled in there. You can see it was just about dark when we pulled in there. And flagged down a pickup and asked them if there was any place to stay. And they pointed out a little hotel, but it, 
you know, it was just a long building with four doors on it, no sign, no office, nothing. And uh, we said, so how do we, how do we get a room? He said, well, we'll go get the chief. And you know, they showed up a couple of minutes later with the chief, rented us a couple of rooms and we asked them where we could get something to eat. And they said, well, we haven't eaten yet. We'll make you some food. And they came back with some, I don't know, what, would they, what did they make us there? Some steaks and salad. And I mean, they had a six pack of Budweiser. I mean, people were so good to us. It's just amazing. Yeah. That, man, that's crazy. That's the hospitality of people is never ceases to amaze me. Well, you, you know, we'd pull into places like this. You can see it's just about getting dark. And you know, there's only a couple hundred people there. So we have no, we have no arrangements of where we're going to stay there. Uh, the back of your mind, you're thinking we're going to have to pitch that tent pretty soon. And all of a sudden you got a hotel room and a, you know, home cooked meal. Oh, it was like heaven. Yeah. Thanking your lucky stars on that. Yeah. yeah. This, this little town, we didn't plan on staying there. We planned on going over to, uh, on over to Hay River, I believe. Yeah. But, it was getting dark and this town was like 25 miles kind of the wrong way or 20 miles kind of the wrong way and we thought man let's let's do that and that was one of them times that the next morning when we hit the trail and got a little ways the other side of where we hit the lake the lake just turned into a nightmare just big huge ice heaves everywhere and we thought, man, I'm glad we picked the picked the spot before dark instead of being out there in the middle of that lake in the middle of the night trying to find our way over to Hay River. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you got to trust your gut, right? Yeah, we we had a lot of lucky scenarios. I don't know. We we just yeah we we but management some days <laughs> yeah yeah here's here you are breaking some trail you can see how deep this sleigh is digging into the into the snow and there hasn't been one other sled down this path um and you're along the side of again of a river or, or a lake that's a good example of the broken ice i mean you'd, you know it would be like that for miles and miles and you can't really drive through that and you get on the side and that's that's deep snow i think that snow is probably deeper than it looks when you pull those sleighs it kind of packs it down behind you and makes it look pretty good but uh, it was pretty yeah deep stuff. yeah i bet you'd be spinning a lot here's a i like this shot because it shows the snow dust up your back like just to give you an idea, if you're if you're watching this or if you're listening to this podcast, that they're going across this lake and the and the rider is just covered in white snow dust. You know, it's pretty thick, uh, pretty thick coating on it. It kind of shows how hard it is to see all the broken ice chunks and stuff too. I mean, it all just kind of looks white. Hard to tell what you're coming to. You must have been like that when you're riding, though, too. There must have been times a day when everything just, the light made everything look so flat, right? Yeah, it was, you know, it was sometimes it was hard to see and kind of stressful trying to find a route. That's a, me and Rex would kind of tag off leading just to, just to give, you know, the other guy kind of a break so he didn't have to think about it for a while. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, flat, incredible. That light one of the worst things um flat light it's a it's a son of a gun you you can't see nothing you can't read the bumps you can't read nothing no i know i've i've experienced it on trail riding but not not to the what you guys are going through at all i don't want to diminish that because i can imagine it's your especially when you get in a big area like that when all it is is white you have no trees to reference or anything nearby to reference any depth changes that type of thing right you uh this this shot here looks like you're in a Kwanzaa hut shed like drive shed are they what are they working on your sleigh 
Yeah, it looks like they're working on replacing this, the runners on your sleigh. You know, we stopped into that town. We're staying at the hotel and needed to make some repairs to our sleigh. And they said, yeah, let's go across the street over to that shop. And again, they let us use their shop uh, kind of after hours. And that, that young kid there just hung around to help us out. We replaced some runners on the bottom of one of the sleighs. I think that looks like Paul's sleigh. We're changing some of the runners out. Yeah. What's on the gas can, the caps? Uh, uh, is it a, are they pump nozzles or siphon nozzles? Like, what do you, what do you got on those big gas cans at the back? Well, they're just a standard gas cap um, that we don't use. Um, but I, it's a no spill brand or whatever it is. And I actually cut the, the mechanism that makes it move off and filled it up with, um, uh, JB Weld epoxy stuff, and then you just unscrew the cap when you want the oh, gas. Neat. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, and then um, I think we pretty much did that with all the cans. Um, you know, we want you really, we run it through the filter. Uh, we brought a couple good filters along um, with that fine mesh in them. They actually pick up water and then any other debris you get, and then we'd. Um, when we'd stop, we'd fill up, put the funnel, you know, in, in each machine. You know, we'd fill it up, run it through a funnel before. We will not just put the gas in directly. Mm-hmm. Because you now, don't know do what you, you, did you, no, you don't know what you're getting. Did you run any additives or anything in the fuel to, to cut ethanol or water or anything like that? No, I think we, we added some isopropyl in there a couple times, I believe, but not much. I think most of the gas has got 10% or something in it now. Right, right. That's just for freezing, right? Yeah. Well, there's that same shot from early in the day. Just starting out. Do you recall what this is? Uh, just a typical winter road. I think that was heading just... towards Fort McPherson. Did you you guys must have relished when you came to a spot like this? Well, it was pretty nice at times, you know, and just to be nice and flat, and the way you go. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. And you don't have to worry about hitting anything that's hidden, that type of thing. How often did you see the northern lights? I think they were out quite a bit, but we were sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's my problem here. Everybody posts pictures of the Northern Lights and, you know, I'm sleeping in that day. I, I wasn't sure if this was Northern Lights or if this was uh, Rob's sled on fire. <laughs> <laughs> it is our cat green. It is our cat <laughs> green after all. It looks like it was out of Wiggly, wasn't it, Rob? Yeah, we had gone, uh, we'd... We just got in late that night. That's why we happened to see those northern lights. Typically, we were sleeping by then, but we got into that town pretty late at night and happened to see them. Yeah, that would be that would be something else up there where it's so dark. You know, they you, there's no light pollution when you get up there. So this looks like it's actually in Paul's shop. I think is it? Yeah. Yeah. Believe so. Removing some parts from the parts snowmobile. Yeah. When you got back, did you put that one back together as as rideable or? Well, that's the plan, but it's still sitting. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> changed. We unloaded. I'm happy. Grabbed our toothbrush and left the snowmobiles away. <laughs> you know, I I'm happy to hear that. You know, because that's exactly what I would have done. <laughs> I'll have to get to work on it there one of these days, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Is this, Are you just stopping, checking the loads here and stuff? It could be. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, we every morning we'd take off, and after a ways we'd stop and kind of double check everything, make sure everything's still tied on there. Yeah, that's smart. More lake passes here. 
Again, it's not as smooth as what you'd think it would be, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can actually see where your knee's wearing the sticker on the on the console away in that shot. Yeah, I did that on my sled. The other guys didn't do that. I don't. I don't know. I must ride. I must you lean must into sit it more forward. Yeah. Yeah. I love this shot. This is the one I use for the the thumbnail with the little warming hut. Uh, did you stay the night here, or is this just a stop for? I think we stayed there, didn't we? Yeah, we stayed there. We came. Uh, we got over the. We went through the over the Richardson Mountains that day, and got down to the Porcupine River, and we were following a, a trail, a local trail. When we got to the Porcupine River. We knew that we had to take a right and go like, I don't know, Rex, you remember, maybe 100 miles or something. And it was pretty late in the day. And when we got to the river, we saw the track went to the left. And we were confused by that, why why they went to the left. And we could see kind of a, a teepee made out of, you know, just like three logs stacked together in the river, like a half mile, three quarters of a mile in that direction. We couldn't figure out what that was. We drove down there just to look, and here there was this shelter cabin there. Uh, the other people must have stayed there to stop there to warm up or whatever. But uh, you know, it was it was getting really late in the day. Uh, we again, we were just like perfect in <laughs> a place to, yeah. to move in and stay. You have, and you couldn't have seen many people the whole ride, right? We saw very few people. Yeah. This looks like a marked trail across a lake. It's got stakes. What's yeah, this we're closer going to home? Lake of the Woods. Lake of the Woods, yeah. So that's closer to home. Yeah. Looks like someone's trying to side, you know, tip the sled up on its side there. I don't know what we we're doing there. Yeah. Maybe just horsing around. And then it, uh, where was this? This is a. Uh, this looks like Rex talking to talking to some locals. Wasn't that for? Uh, is that an old crow, guys? Or not old crow, but I mean. Uh, Fort Yukon. Fort, Fort Yukon, yeah. Yeah. He came and got into Fort, Fort Yukon pretty late, and the the locals were had kind of a potluck dinner waiting for us. And, it was so interesting when that would happen. I mean, the, you know, people would be sitting there and want to hear how your day went and tell you some stories about their past and really added to the trip. We really enjoyed it. That's very cool. Man, you guys seen so much of that generosity, right? I love the young guy there, just totally into, into it and hearing the stories and things like that, right? Yeah. Welcome to Fairbanks, the Golden Heart City. So this is after a ride. You've got you've changed into your street clothes and you're you just come out to the sign to pose. Yeah, we were hanging around town there for a couple of days trying to get out of there. So taking a few pictures and screwing around. Yeah, nice. And how did you what time did you say your day started and ended typically? Well, we go right about half an hour or so before daybreak, and then um, most of the time we get try to get before dark. Uh, but sometimes it was over two hours, three hours, four hours over. I forget what town it was, but we got in quite late that night. Um, it was about 11, 12 o'clock, so you're looking at three, four hours in the dark. You know, and that yeah, time. wow. Yeah. Here's another trail, but it doesn't look like anyone had, has been down it for a day or so. How much snow did they get during the ride? Did you have days where there wasn't any snow, but there was days where you were socked in? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I get snowed um, up there by Tommy Birds at and South End or whatever it was. And then um, I think that's about the only snow that we actually run into. 
It's all right. A couple of little shots of snow. And by by south end there, it snowed real hard, but we had a lot of nice yeah. days. Yeah, and that's that's remarkable for a 39-day trip, you know, to not get any a real beast of a storm blowing. They're out front of the uh, that Northern Power Sports store again. Y'all look happy here. So that is yeah, yeah. that. <laughs> I mean, we made it and we were all alive, so we were pretty happy. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> this is some barren land. Is this typical know. when you get closer to the Yukon? Yeah, you yeah. can that anywhere, but I don't know where that was. Yeah. Loaded up before or after, or what, what was this shot? That's was when we loaded up about just about the Fairbanks. Um, a friend of mine from Anchorage had been in contact with some of the well, my, my one of my boys and Rob's daughter, and they came up and um, we loaded them up. He had a big long crater, and we were what fifty miles from Fairbanks. I'm pretty sure. And then where did they where did they go? Like this is this is when you're finished. They're going home, or did you actually trailer them for part of the ride? We took them to to the Arctic Cat dealer. Oh, okay, I got you. And then they hauled them back. Yeah. Right, right at the end of the trip there, we had some bad, some tough luck there. We got to circle Alaska. We were 150 miles from the finish. Started my sled up and didn't have any spark. We lost a stator in my sled. So we left my sled there and took off with the other two sleds for Fairbanks, thinking we'd make it to Fairbanks that day. And uh, somebody had sent us a message, said that they... They were at mile marker 60 or something, and they would give us a cup of coffee if we wanted to stop and we went by. And just before that, Rex has had a problem with his sled. Uh, Rex's sled had been on fire a couple of days before that and burnt way worse than mine. And wow. We got it running, but then right before the end, it locked up, and you know, we think, it was probably something from the fire that affected the oil lines or something. So now we got one snowmobile left. So we limped over to this house where we were going to have coffee and sent a message to my daughter that we needed a truck and trailer at mile 60 and had no idea what he was going to do with that information. Uh, oh, we lost his audio there. I wonder if his headphones came unplugged. Try the plug on the computer. Nope. Oh, wait, he's muted. Hang on. Try that, Rob. No, we lost his audio. Oh, no. It was going so good. <laughs> Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll try to take over anyway. We uh, so Paul's Paul's uh, friend from Clearback in high school lives in uh, Fairbanks or or near there. Uh, has done for quite a while. But anyway, they they got things together and just within sh shoot a half an hour or so. Of, they was up there with that pickup and trailer and all this rest way into Fairbanks, which was another good deal because the snow ended. We'd been on, uh, we'd been fighting pavement and stuff trying to get into Fairbanks. So what, Fairbanks, oh, there was quite a bit of snow, but it'd been warm enough. All the streets were bare, so it it was a good thing we just hauled them in from there because we'd been back on bare pavement and and. Uh, didn't really know the trail system around there to get into Fairbanks without. Uh, so uh, 
Yeah, we just trailered them in about the last 50 miles. Well, that that's good. It happened when it did, though, right? Oh yeah. You know, you're yeah. you you were you were at the finish line anyway, so that's uh, really good. Good, actually, good timing. I like this. The Mad Trapper Albert Johnson arrived in Ross River August twenty first, nineteen twenty seven. Complaints of local trapper brought the RCMP on him. He shot two officers and became a fugitive of the law. With howling huskies, dangerous trails, frozen nights, the posse finally caught up with him. He was killed up the Eagle River February 17th, 1932. What other landmarks like that did you guys see during the ride? I don't think I, that's about the, the only one, really. That, um, But there's quite a story beyond that. Rob actually had read that book. Uh, he showed it. He had, I think he brought it along with us, and we were kind of browsing through it before we got up there. Uh, so there's quite a story behind that. Too bad, Rob's uh, mic is gone. Are you back yet, Rob? You can just try unplugging your, uh, hitting the gear icon and see if you can change your settings back to your headphones or or your computer mic and your computer speakers and see if that helps. We can always circle back to that, pardon the pun. Yeah, more, more lake footage there. This is a nice typical trail. Rob's tech support is on scene. <laughs> yeah. These are, this is a lodge or cabins. Do you remember where this was? I believe that was a place we stayed. I think it was called Slim's. I forget what town or lake that's on. And that was right before we started going into the bush. Actually, I think we left our boggins there and took one can of gas each. And we went up and started milling our way through that, um, that, old um, railroad line and then we came back the next day and we stayed again and then we hooked up our boggins and then we then we headed out it was only yeah. like about a 40 mile run up the up to where we had to get into the bush that to me seems like the the tough thing is planning when to like 40 miles doesn't seem lo like a like a lot, but figuring out when to hold them and when to fold them, like when to stop that day, right? And trudge yeah. on would be the would be the tough part, you know. This is this is breaking some trail through little, like you said, the little saplings, you know, possibly after a forest fire and they're growing up and you're uh, you're in the throes and they're about ten feet high and it's just thick of saplings. Yeah, but that's what we did that one particular day. But the mo and then a lot of times we'd just go in and pull our drop our boggins and then take off from there and then go bust up through. But then it's a fine line. You got to make sure you got enough gas to get back to your boggins. Yeah, yeah. Michael Milner says, Rob, thanks for coming out to the MN USA Fall Workshop over the weekend. You guys must get a lot of opportunities to, to for meet and greets and things like that. This is Circle City. You're at the sign for uh, Circle City in Alaska, is it? Yep. It's, um, it's right on the, I'm not sure what river that is. But anyhow, what, um, that was one of the last towns we stayed in. The Yukon River, it says on the sign. Okay, yeah. And yeah. we uh, when we got into there, we actually we slept in the school, um, and they fed us in the school, it's like a one room or gym, gymnasium. They had uh, some food for us, and we slept in the library on the floor. It was um, well, that's good. At least it's and warm and dry, right? Oh yeah, and we put our snow machines in the fire hall. Uh, I think the whole town is probably about. 100 people, if that. The school probably has the whole crew, probably 
30, 40, if that. It was interesting. Yeah. You know, that's got to be a big uh, a big bonus to have your sleds inside all overnight to just de-ice, right? Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, then you can see stuff that you wouldn't normally see. In that particular case, we had um, some some work to do on them. Um, some it's, bogey wheels on the bottom of the suspension got broken. A front arm shock broke. And um, so it was kind of nice to, to have that. Yeah. And did you set aside time each day to say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna do a half hour once over on these things, or or schedule time for repairs, or you just didn't, uh, um, you just I didn't. Think, uh, we just kind of went as we went. We'd stop and um, we checked the tracks. You know, if one guy's track, we had to tighten them up a couple times, um, and then when we got up to, uh, I forget, uh, Stony Rapids, I think it was. <laughs> Spend a day there. Um, it was the, the ski doo dealer let us use his shop, yeah. and um, sweet. So that it was kind of we kind of planned that out, and then um, otherwise we just kind of checked them over as we went. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, here's your typical. You know, you can't go anywhere until you cut a path. Your snowmobile's right at a down tree and. Away you go. So what is what are we looking at here? Is that a is that a, some type of building that's buried in the snow, or what are we looking at here? Do you recognize a picture? Oh, I couldn't. I don't know what that is. That might be the outhouse at one of them cabins. Oh, could be. I, I can't see it that good. No, it's it almost looks like it's buried in snow, whatever it is. You'd have to climb down inside. And the snow was pretty deep in a few places out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is this pre-planning? It looks like you're sitting in a nice warm home with a... Christmas tree and the computer out. Looks like you get the map opened up. Paper maps on the table. Yeah, I think that might be at Rob's house. Or uh, we met up. We he was in Arizona for a month, and we met up down there. I think, and that might have been when we was down there looking over maps. GPS routes and whatnot. Right on. Seems how it's just for Christmas, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're getting close, right? Yeah. And this is a is this a trapper place here? You've got furs mm -hmm. hanging up and I think that's that Skadoo dealership where we where we got in and worked on our sleds that one time very cool furs and uh, all kinds of things yeah there's there's still a lot you know there's still quite a few guys out trapping and i mean not nothing like there used to be you know when gas was a dollar 90 and uh yeah and uh you know and there was a better market for fur but there's there's still a few guys out doing it but they don't have to go very far from town, so they're not traveling. The, you know, I mean, we're on, you know, we're on pretty good trails, or or at least a track, you know, a trapper's track. When we was, yeah, yeah. A little closer to towns, you know, 10, 10 miles out or something. But. I'm just gonna plug my headphones in one second. My batteries ran dead on the old headphones there. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 
I'm I'm kind of in a remote location as far as uh, we're working on a on a uh, Elon Musk system up here where we're at right now, and I it's kind of been going in and out, so I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, you're doing good though. It's you're coming in nice and clear. Very cool. There's a I, nice I, sun. Yeah. There's a brilliant sunset shot. That might be a. It might be a sunrise. Oh, is that if right? I remember, okay. If I remember right. Have we got Rob back now? Do you want to give a test, Rob? No. No, we still don't have him. I don't. I don't know what happened to his audio there. I think it's in the. I think it's in the little gear. <laughs> now there's two of him. I know. I think he's he's tried to get in on his iPad. I'm trying to unmute that other mic, but it's not working. But yeah, so. And then this is this is uh, at some sort of uh, community center, I think it is. Yeah, I I'm not sure. I think that's a museum, a little kind of a museum uh, in Innovic. Innovic's probably the biggest town we've seen after we left Linflon. It's. Uh, oh, I, I hear him. He's got sound. <laughs> no, that that might be. He just has to plug his headphones in. I think he's good to go. Can you hear me now? I can. We we did good. miss you, believe it or not. <laughs> we did, we did miss you. This is the funny thing. I think uh, no, I don't have the map. The map I moved, but. This shows you how much you doubled back and, you know, went here and there. Was it, was it getting lost that caused you to double back or was it, was it you were doing that for a purpose, whether for warmth or fuel or food? Well, there's, what I was trying to show there when you, the overall map showed the colored line and underneath it was a black line where we actually went. And when you zoom it out and look at the whole thing, you can't see the black line at all. It looked like we followed exactly on the track we'd made at home. And when you yeah. zoom in, the, the, the straight blue line is the line we made at home. The road on there, there, there is no road there. And the black line is where we were trying to find our way through those cat trails. And you could see us double back and dead ends. I mean, you, you kind of see what a struggle we were having in that area. So it looked like you went up and down the trail the same time, three times. Yeah, we were going back and forth. You know, sometimes we would have to unhook, we'd unhook our sleighs because it was so difficult and try to find the route and, and clear the trees. And then we'd go back and get our sleighs. So even though. You know, when you when you look at the overall map and you think we had this all programmed or programmed into the GPS, all we had to do was follow the line on the GPS. It uh, it didn't work out quite that easily. Yeah, I know that that gives you an appreciation of what it was like. That shot there, I loved it. Here's another. Is that a warming hut back there as well? Yeah, we're at a trapper's cabin on the McKinsey River. We're actually staying in a cabin. I'm probably standing on the porch taking that picture. And there was two cabins there. So we're just uh, doing a little maintenance that night and relaxing on the McKinsey River. And they're wide open, like anybody's allowed to use them. And, you know, there's wood and everything in there, is it? The most of these were private cabins. I mean, people own these cabins, but they would they would tell us where they were and uh, explain to us that they were there just for travelers like us, and you know that was okay to use them. And you just would leave the cabin the way you found it, you know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And man, that's a lifesaver in in these conditions, right? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And uh, here we are on the lakes. You can see how how the ice is clear, blown off there. There's another good shot coming up. I really like with showing your boot hanging over the. And uh, here we are on the lake. Oh, this is a. You're blown off there. This is a. Somebody got stuck. Was this a common occurrence? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's when you said you need to be in better shape for lifting them out of this. That must have been a hell of a pile of weight there. Yeah, that was just one of the many times. Yeah. You you couldn't lift them. You'd pretty well just tromp around them, uh, you know, get all the snow tromped down on them, and then two or three guys heave on them and get them moving again. Yeah, you know? and hold, hold it to the bar kind of thing, right? Oh, sometimes it's better just to hit it a little, guys. just a little jerk so it's on them. Work it or pop itself yeah, back up on top. Yeah, right on. I'm just muting your mic there, Rob, until yeah, you plug your headphones in, so we're not getting the echo back there. So this is your tent setup. Yeah, that's what. That's where we stayed at on. Uh, between uh, Flynn's Lawn and uh, South End, I think. Yeah. Man, right out in the wind, the windswept lake, no shelter around you as far as it trees go. It was calm when we pitched it, but then the wind picked up during the night. Yeah. And did you have heaters or anything like that, or you're just sleeping in the cold? No. Oh, we had a wood burner. Did you? A yeah. little wee one? And did you have heaters or anything? Well, it gets pretty hot. I, I, I got the whole thing like a sauna. I got, I got, they got, they were a little bit disgusted with me. That's yeah. okay. I can put a lot of heat. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, Paul always had a good fire going. That's always. good. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he sounds like the kind of guy you need to travel this. They're showing your double windshield thing, one behind the other. So if you break one, you've got a spare to give to your friend. Yeah, and then then you can set the, you know, you can kind of move it up or down, get the heights you want that fits fits your liking, you know. Like this, just the one stock windshield wasn't quite enough to protect you. Yeah, um, that's right. But that's you, right. you put the other in a little higher, and then you get more protection plus you got the spare windshield yeah that's right that's good good idea very smart this is this shot i love here with the ice showing the water what lake was that on probably lake. We, it's like a uh there's a uranium mine up there and and there's a ice road that goes across there i think we was on that ice road maybe Right. That, that ice under, uh, under there uh, it had been uh, ice road. Pick, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just muting you, Rob, so we don't get the echo until you plug your headphones in. You might have to hit the gear to change the audio setting back to your headphones. Yeah. From yeah. your speakers. I'm just muting you, Rob, so we oh. don't get... I love those shots like that, though. There's another lake that's actually just blown ice chunks everywhere covered in snow yeah, so you had some path, you had some path to follow but they're old paths <clears throat> yes yeah there was there was uh oh yeah down the mckinsey river there was uh there was a stretch there that somebody had been down from uh let's see fort I can't remember anyway, down there about 60 miles. And that was, that was a welcome sight to be able to follow that, that track. Oh, for sure. This is a close up of the camping, uh, the, the tent set up. 
So how thick are the walls of the tent? Do they keep some insulation or is it pretty thin? Oh, I don't, it's called, it's an Arctic man, I believe it is. They made up in Fairbanks. It's, um, it's actually like a two part deal. There's like an outer one that goes over the top of it. Um, and it, um, they're, they're made for winter camping and um, it's a pretty good unit. Um, I don't know, Rob got a line on it up there and he ordered it. And I think, I think he got rid of it up there in Fairbanks too. We didn't haul it home. It's, you, um, you, didn't want to, you didn't want to think you're ever going to do this again, so you need it anymore, uh, right? I don't know what the deal was, but he wanted to get rid of it. But he, he set it up. Um, he had practice run. I think he did it in his house. And then we did it one time out up here at my place. Because, uh, you know, to know how they – it's got rods and everything to, so you know what the heck's going on before you start out with it, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty neat the technology and camping gear though, right? That you can you think you can be staying out in awesome. minus thirty, minus forty temperatures when in just a tank, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is is this inside one of the warming huts, trapper cabins? Uh that's this, actually uh, the one right before we went over to the Richardson Mountains. I think we stayed there two or three nights. Uh, really? It's a, I'm not sure who owns the cabin. It's just a, a cabin. You know, they... I don't know what's going on. People just really use nice. them. They had um, wood supply there, and we cut some wood there for, you know, to keep, you know, the, what we use or so more. Yeah, and yeah. It, it Rob, was, I uh, think you're good. I think you. I think if you, you want to do a sound test... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. You, you're great, yeah. That's perfect. Okay, Thank good. you for setting that up. Yep. Yeah, I love the I love the uh, forty five gallon drum wood stove in this thing. That's ingenuity. Yeah, that was a that was a pretty nice cabin. We uh, there there's one like this on each side of the the passage that it's a historic passage that they used to get over the Richardson Mountains from uh, from Fort, Fort McPherson over to. Uh, to uh, old girl, and yeah, uh, nice. and uh, it's it's basically just a survival cabin, and uh, yeah, it was pretty nice. Looks like you got a couple like uh, cooking up some sausages there. Yeah, it was uh, kind of it was it was one of our better meals on the road. Um, <laughs> and that stove, you know, see how they make them around here? They make barrel stoves. You know, round on top, and here they got them standing up. We had a couple of cabins we were in that had them like that. Yeah, so that was cut right on. Yeah, genius. Yeah. Gary, do you, have, do you can you find the picture? Uh, there's a picture with Paul and Rex eating supper in one of those cabins. Uh, I don't yeah, know if, it's you, a, if it's easy to find that or not. There's more of those those double back paths. <laughs> Let me see here. Look at the snow in that sled there. So th is this the cabin here on the outside? Looks yeah, like you're fixing your sleigh. It's one of the cabins. Yeah, we had to do a little work on my sleigh there. Yeah. There's another stuck. You did get stuck a lot, didn't you? Look how Quite deep the whoever is in the back there, how deep they're going through. Wow. See if I can find it. What were this this shot here as like a kind of a totem teepee? Is that a marker to help you find your way? Like where the is that what that's out there for? Other people yeah. left it, built it. I don't know where that was, but they that's the way they do that. They'll go up in the woods and they'll they'll find three poles or some kind of a tree that's fairly straight, and they they just tip them up against each other. That way the wind doesn't blow them over, and that's how they mark a lot of their for trappers or people going from village to village or for whatever reason. Yeah. So you kind of, if you see those, you know, you're on the right path then, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, I think that's the trail that goes up over the Richardson mountains. And it was, uh, once we got up out of the Creek bottoms, it was, it was marked here and there with them uh, out, out quite a ways from that cabin. 
nice. get up into the barrens there. There's just nothing up there. So, and it, it was marked like that, but not very often. I mean, like, it seemed like every couple miles, it was difficult to find our way through there. Oh, I bet. I think there is another shot of it too. Is this some more locals uh, in their hospitality that we're looking at here? Yeah, that's where we had that um, moose tongue. It was mm. pretty darn good. Then that white stuff that looks like lard, that's um, bear fat. And they eat it just like I said earlier, like peanut butter. Really? And, wow. Yeah, it was interesting. I forget guy this named, guy. Uh, he was Earl, real. Earl Evans was the guy's name. He came over and uh, saw us at the hotel and had some advice for us on the route we were taking the next day and invited us over for supper. And we had uh, boiled moose tongue, uh, dried moose meat and bear fat, bannock and uh, homemade jam. Uh, just a super cool traditional meal. Love it. This is somewhere way up north. This is up at Tuck, and those are polar bear hides nailed to the side of the buildings. Wow. See, I'm surprised you didn't see any polar bears, right? This, this is either sunrise or sunset. I'm guessing that's sunset. Yeah. You can see how thick the frost is. Is this the shot you're looking for? Yeah. It, nice. like Paul said the, the sausages are one of the better meals. You know, we brought, I think I brought three or four freeze dried suppers in case for when, for when I thought we were going to have to stay in the tent. But as it worked out, we started staying in these cabins a lot. So we ate, we ate those up right away. And of course, these small communities, you can't just go buy some more freeze-dried food. So we were kind of struggling as we're looking around the store trying to find, you know, what kind of food can we buy that can freeze during the day, but, but is easy to make at night. And what do we end up with? Swanson and uh, frozen oh, peanuts. <laughs> we, would, we would put those on top of the barrel stove and warm them up and it tasted pretty good, but I think it was because we were so hungry. I was going to say that. That's funny. It looks like the, the tray's melted. You just put the, the whole tray up on the stove? The I went set it on, on rock. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Put some tin foil over them. Yeah. Here you are tinkering them. This, this, is this at the dew dealer? This is at that uh, Scotty's in Stony Rapids. This yeah. is a, I like this picture because we took a day off there. So uh, people that were following us on Facebook are saying, oh, it's nice to get to take a day off. Well, this is what it looks like to take a day off when you're one of the three old guys. Rex is laying on the floor there trying to grease the suspension a little bit or something. Yeah. Oh, I know it's not really a day off, right? Here you are eating like kings again. Do you remember what this gentleman's name was? Uh, you know, that was up there at the South End, wasn't it? That was a Tommy Birds. I think his name was Harold. He's He was a trapper that had sent us a key bit of information that got us through there. I think it was Hector, remember? Oh, yeah, it could have been Hector. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. yeah. He's the one that brought us down the fish. Yeah. Boiled lake trout. Pretty doggone good. Yeah, it looks like you're eating fish there. That's great. Yeah. Wow, eh? The, the humanity. Here's, here's Rex just chilling. It's like he's got a, a scratch or a spring or something in his hand. Oh, that's up my shop here. I can tell by the junk. Is yeah. So is this beforehand? Just you guys, your wives took some pictures just for identification if you went missing? <laughs> <laughs> it's a 
sitting around Paul's shop having a couple of beers, uh, a lot of damn good trips been planned like that. Yeah, that's right. This is this a, a, a volcanic mountain or something way in the back there. I don't know where that is. Yeah, that's true. Cool. Tuck 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 again. Land of the pingos. Oh, that's where are pingos. That, that's that's uh, right. that that picture just for this was a pingo. It's uh, that's a pingo. Yeah. Is it a pingo? Is what a mountain? Uh, it's a, it's a yeah, a little knob that's been pushed up from. See, I can't remember the what makes them, but it's something to do with the permafrost or something. I think They're almost the like water, little volcanoes. Maybe the water under the permafrost freezes and pushes them up, or something like that. Yeah. There you go again, all dressed up in the climb, getting ready. You must be heading out. It looks like a morning shot. Pretty crazy. Not sure. That that's not a pingo there. That's a mountain range, right? I kept telling these guys how we were gonna ride through the Richardson Mountains like it was gonna be so easy. And as we started getting closer, I was thinking, boy, these are real mountains. This might not be so easy as I thought. Yeah, they're they're big. I think that's I think that mountain range is up by Fort Good Hope off to the we didn't go over. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm you not, didn't go did you have to go over, over did mountain. you did you have to traverse anything like that or did you kind of go around it? Oh, uh, there's passes through it if I mean maybe if if there's a reason to go there. Yeah. Here's another one of those markers. So you'd be following those through the passes around the uh, through the mountains, would you? Yeah, yeah that was that. most of them were on the foothills, I think, of the mountains. I don't know where that one was. Yeah, yeah, up on up on top of the Richardson Mountains, there was no trees. It was above tree line. Is that so right? That would, have been, <clears throat> that would have been, you know, in the hills before you got up into the main mountain. Yeah. This looks like you're high up here. You can see kind of mountains behind you. Yeah. Like it looks like this might be on top of one of the mountains, would it be? Yeah. That's just going see, up we the went, foot, foothills. We went, up the there, uh, we went up there the first day up and and uh, we, we kept barely seeing the old trail and uh so we went back to the cabin and then the next day we was up in there and had kind of figured out the trail but not all the way to the top and here here comes a, a native guy that uh was going over the top to meet a group of people that was coming up the other way and so we followed him to the top but the wind was, I mean, you couldn't see, you couldn't see the guy in front of you sometimes. And uh, the, the native says, uh, it's too dangerous. We got to go back. Of course, we weren't going to go on by ourselves. So we went back. That's when that nice cabin, that's where we. Oh, that's why you said you stayed there a couple of nights. Because you doubled, oh, yeah. you doubled back, back. Pardon me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like mile marker zero was on the sign, or kilometer zero. I think that's early on in the trip when we left Tommy Bird's place at the fresh snow on the highway. I got gotcha. you. Another untouched, uncharted path here. I love this cabin. Is this the outside of that same one? Yeah, I think that's the one we stayed in two nights. Yeah, it's, it's cool. I don't think so. Maybe no. it is. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, kind of got a little porch or balcony on the side of it. That that might be the one down the other side where the caribou hunters were staying. 
That could be. Maybe, I don't know. It's got a nice fire going in there. It looks like a lot of room, too. It looked like a big cabin. This shows you how tight the trails are here. Wow. Like, you get the width of the snowmobile, and that's it. Did they get bashed up pretty good as far as the side panels go? Yeah, they got quite a bit of brush marks on them and stuff. But they held up pretty good. Yeah. More barren lakes. This is some high ice formations here. There was a few times out in that real rough ice, Rob was in the lead. He'd have to get his axe out and bust the bigger, sharper pieces off and and uh, so we could get through them. And uh, there, was, there was one stretch there. Rob must have swung an axe for two hours, breaking us Seriously? a trail. It probably went a half a mile to get through a couple of them. Wow. That like is I say, we didn't, we didn't take pictures of the bad stuff. We was too busy trying to <laughs> get our way through them. Well, that's the thing. You don't know how long. Exactly. You don't know how long. My chunks was as tall as a house. <laughs> wow. That's insane. Well, that's the thing. You don't know how long it's going to take you, so you want to get it done as soon as you can, right? Yeah, you want to keep, you want to keep moving. Yeah. The mountains in the background of this photo are beautiful. I wonder if that isn't when we got over the top of the mountain heading towards Old Crow. Yeah, that kind of kind of looks like it, don't it? Yeah, I think so. It's very cool. Like that's the stuff that Rob was saying. You know, like you you got to appreciate the scenery like that. Is this this is the bear fat uh, house from a different angle? I think so. Oh, that was a fun. How much afternoon. you guys appreciate a hot cup of coffee when you ended up at these places? Yeah, we did. And this is a beautiful sunset shot to end the day. Here's that map to show you where it is. So you're saying the black lines are in inside of this red line, is it? Yeah, the, the colored line is what we planned out at home. And the black yeah. line where we actually went is on there too, but you can't even see it. So, it, you know, when you look at this, it's like, boy, we did an excellent job of planning it. We went, you know, exactly on the route. Well, when yeah. you zoom in, you find out it's not quite like that. Yeah. All Terrain TV wants to know, did the bear fat taste like hamburger or more like real butter? Uh, it's, it's a flavorful fat. Lard, kind of like. So it does taste like lard. It just... Uh... Well, the bear fat tasted like lard. Uh, the, the bear tongue tasted... I don't know how to describe it. I mean, it was, it was good, but it was... Just it was moose tongue. Taste. Yeah, moose I've tongue. I've had cow yeah. tongue before, and it's it's all right. It's probably very similar, I would think. But... Yeah, probably. There's another un, uncharted lake or something, not a not a footstep or snowmobile track to be seen. So you're just relying on GPS and and you know luck. <laughs> yeah, there, that's more of the cutting. Here's the bed shot with your tools trying to fix the exhaust or the uh, the air box. So you JB weld and you got some tin some rolled tin tin snips and here you are working away on it so is that the finished product right there well that's what it looks like from the factory so that you're trying to make it look like that one uh, oh i got you yes because <laughs> you can you can water. see how that one is molded i mean it just barely what's got to fit just right on there so so we tried to make it we thought we did a pretty good job of matching that up. 
Of course, when we went to put it on the next morning, we had to get the get the rubber mallet on it and whale on it for a while to get it to fit on there. Oh, geez. Yeah, because you can see where it's got bumps. must be for the intake of the exhaust or something that's sticking up in there. Very important. Mm -hmm. There's another traversing along the edge of the hills. This this cabin, this shot's really cool. The candle going. You guys pack the candles or are they there? That one was there. We had some with us too, but I think that one was there. Yeah. Um, That's, I think, that same river from earlier. Here we go. Is this another friend you made along the way, Rob? Yeah, that was the chief in Fort Resolution that rented us a couple hotel rooms there. We were, you could tell on my face we were pretty happy to get them. Get That's the great. I'll just, I, we, we've road. been, I've, I've taken enough of your time, so I won't hold you too much, but I'll just flip through these and let me know if you see anything that you want to chat about. The ice in this shot's incredible. Well, Showing your wiring some, and everything. Yeah, that's some of Rex's snowmobile after the fire. Oh, is that right? Wow. What a mess. This is another cabin or a lodge you stayed in? Yeah, another another cabin type place we rented one night yeah. and uh, I think it was in Wrigley. That's decent. Big propane furnace or gas furnace there. Or is that electric? It's pretty cool. Here she is again. Look at that. Is that the tongue right there? Yeah. yeah wow, it's huge. More mountain ranges, working on the sleds there. This is, uh, looks like, uh, looks like uh, Paul's home. Yeah. There's a nice meal. That's, Where was that's this? A, that's the meal that that couple brought us in uh, Fort Resolution. I mean, we, we just rolled into bugs. town. And they said they'd whip, they'd make us some supper and came back with that within a half an hour. I mean, excellent supper. People were just really nice to us. Yeah, that's good. And then this is the last photo I got. You guys at Heydays, how did that go for you? It was pretty fun. Lots of people came, stopped by. Uh, that's a picture of me and my daughter that did all the Facebook posting. So Great it was kind of fun to visit with people. Yeah, that's cool. You've probably seen all the fans you had. So if people want to keep in touch with you, how do they, what's your social media channel name? Well, three old guys ride to Alaska. That's our, that's our Facebook page. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So, Hey, listen, I won't keep you any longer. I want to thank you both for your, all three of you for your time tonight. It's been a great show. It's been a long show. Um, just, I'm going to end the show, but if you have any parting words, before we, we close the show off. And thanks for having us, I guess. Hey, no problem. And yeah, just, uh, yeah, no problem. And just before yeah. you go, just stay on, stay online until it tells you to go. I'll end the credits and then we'll just, you won't be live anymore, but we can chat for a bit until it finishes the, the process. Okay. William McClearly says this was an excellent show. Corey Brock says great show. Gary, he's got to go. You know, so thank you everybody for sticking to the end. We still have 35 people in the chat, um, but uh, we're going to call it a night. Everybody's got to work tomorrow and uh, you two stay online for a bit and we'll, uh, we'll get this show um, on the road. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. It was a fun time. Thank you. journey